So good evening, folks. I know uh, people are still slowly joining in here. My name is Rich Wisniewski, and I'm uh, the volunteer MC for tonight. Um, I, I said to Paul Tupacheski once, why don't we have an MC at the spring meeting? And he says, you should have one, and you should do it. So that's <laughs> how I got that job. Um, Doug I'll Barbarian. be careful what I say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Doug Barbero's presentation will start as, as advertised at 8 p.m. We will use the time between now and then. For those that you've joined, we can, uh, we can chat a little bit. I offered to show uh, some various uh, drawings that I have, uh, electronic versions of some 100-year-old you know, drawings of things, if that's of any interest to people. If people have yes. questions <laughs> about things uh, going on in the railroad world, we can discuss that as well. As sort of the, the warm up here to the to the main program. So, any opening comments anybody has? Uh, those electronic drawings you talked about sound just fine. Okay, well, I'm going to start with um, something that I was reading on uh, a Facebook page today about Short Hills Station. Uh, Lackawanna station in suburban station in New Jersey. And let's see if I can make this work. Uh, do I have share control here? Up, oh, give me oh. one second, Rich. I might have to do something here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jim. Okay, you should be able to share now. <laughs> All right, can you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is, uh, I'll zoom in a little bit. Station at Short Hills for the Lackawanna Railroad. Frank J. Nye's architect, Lincoln Bush, chief engineer. Nine, uh, September 28th, 1906, in, uh, this drawing. And this is just an overall layout of the situation plan um, showing, I guess, what was to be built here. And uh, interestingly, it says for this track here, to New York and Hoboken. Okay, so east is to the right. The main station building in Short Hills, as we know, is on the eastbound side and the shelter house on the westbound side. You know, uh, the, the conversation on Facebook was about you know, we think it was there for setback, so there was room for a third track. There's only two tracks ever built here. But as you can see on the drawing here, it certainly shows uh, three tracks in this layout concept. Now, one thing I can't tell you without going out there and measuring is, is this exactly how the thing got built? You know, where the buildings, whatever that distance is apart. If we zoom in, we can see here, it's showing that uh, they were using 14 foot, six inch track centers between the three tracks. And then what is this, five feet, two and a half inches, probably to the edge of the platform or something like that. And then here's the shelter, the, the westbound building, it's more than the shelter house, stairs, and the subway passes underneath here. So, yeah, it would certainly seem that three tracks was clearly in the thinking at the time this drawing was done. And you know, when you ride the train through there, you can definitely see how that westbound building is, is set back. My memory from growing up in there is that there would have been room for the third track. Yeah, it certainly appears that way when you look out the window. 14 foot six was a very good standard in those days for track centers. The New York Central had some standards for between passenger remains of 12 foot six, and they couldn't meet and pass freight trains with any wide loads on there. It got to be a big problem for them. 14 six was a very, very good standard in those days. Right. Now, like I said, Gordon, what I don't know for sure is 
is that is this exactly how it ended up getting built? That I don't know. Um, but th these are the drawings that we have. So if Lincoln Bush was in charge, it was built the way he signed off on it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The 14.6 would make some sense because just to the east of the platform is a through girder bridge. So there has to be enough clearance um, for the center girder. Right. So, all right, let me, uh, let me find another one. Okay, let's see if this is going to work again. Sorry. Okay, so this one says, addition to Hoboken Signal Tower, 1924. And let me back out a little. And you can see the <clears throat> sort of suggests to me that they were adding a bay window. Yeah. So I don't know. Hoboken signal tower. I don't, I don't know if that means terminal tower or Grove Street. But I don't know if that was. Uh, Hoboken Terminal was Hoboken. Grove Street was Grove Street, so that would have been Terminal Tower. Right. Let's see if this works. Are you looking at a different one now? Yes. Okay. A signal tower at west end of Bergen Tunnel. That was West End. West End mm -hmm. Tower, yeah. And this is dated uh, 1909. And of course, West End later was expanded as well. The rush hammered concrete, bush hammered, I don't know, whatever. Anybody an architect here? That well, looks Link. like it's bush hammered, but I bush thought hammered. it was brush hammered, is I thought the finish. I, I think that was probably a, uh, a a recording error in there. That would have been most likely brush hammer because that's common. Yeah. Okay. And, and there's more of these, so we'll, we'll probably see the you know see it differently. Or, or maybe but, somebody was trying to suck up the Lincoln Bush. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. But if you're uh, interested in recreating a uh, a roof of a Lackawanna Tower, there's your there's your tile. And this uh, plan view shows where the spiral staircase, if you will, would be, and where the machine would go. It specifies a pneumatic machine, too. Yeah. Cold bin. <clears throat> the, uh, you know, the, the 100 years later, the uh, the the handwriting is so impressive to me because I'm the world's sloppiest writer, and you know, with computers, who writes anymore, right? So it's just uh, it was a different time. Right, West End. These are some different views of the different sides of the building. Sure looks like Bush, doesn't it? Yeah, it does.
Oh, this is an interesting one. This is Summit. Combined water tower and signal station. 1904. <clears throat> wow. So it looks like there's a water tower on the roof of the tower. Yeah. Right, there's your mm -hmm. window and stairs. I have no idea if that was ever built that way. We've certainly never seen a photograph of it. Fascinating. That would be quite a roof leak. <laughs> wow. If they needed a water tank at Summit, that was about the only place to put it. And uh, at least they designed the tower so it was structurally able to carry that water tank, whether mm. they built a water tank or not. This is orange. I guess, is this the freight house? Sure looks like it, right? Or was there a combined express house and tower next to the main line at Orange? Well, yeah, there is still the remains of a tower there. Express building and signal tower at Orange. My, for my recollection, at least the, the tower that I'm thinking of that's out there by the main line is not, nowhere near as this large. Right. I don't know. This is fourth floor. That doesn't make sense to me. Is it possible this never got built? Certainly possible. Let's, let's go on to Greensville. Green Greendell, which on this plan is shown as Greensville. There was a name change. 1911. Bush hammered. Yeah. I looked it up online. It is a commercial term for finishing off poured concrete. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. It seems like all these uh, Lackawanna towers were really designed for minimal maintenance. They were all concrete. They had tile roofs or iron roofs. Um, really uh, thought ahead for reduced maintenance. Reduced life cycle costs, right? Mm. And a long life cycle. Next one is Port Morris. Also 1911. Now, this one seems to have somewhat of a basement to it, huh? Let's see what that is. <clears throat> Membrane waterproofing. So this, uh, this looks like, a, I guess, a stairway down to a basement here. And look at this note. Roofers covered with old freight car metal roofing. You know, I've heard people talk about model railroaders and kit bashing and how they uh, um, you know, put took pieces of this and pieces of that and put it all together. Um, I've seen that, especially on the Erie side bridge drawings. Uh, Gordon, you may be familiar with this, but 
Uh, some of these drawing, some of these bridges, it says, uses three stringers from bridge 2733 on the Buffalo and Southwestern, and two girders from the bridge 14.3 on the Newburgh branch. And they cobbled it all together and, and built these bridges out there. It's, uh, so the fact that they were able to maintain that inventory 100 plus years ago, um, no computers, none of that stuff, right, was uh, impressive to me. Another kindred example of something like that is the um, concrete piers for the New York, Ontario and Western Delaware River Bridge. The reinforcing was old rail. Well, that was very common back then. That was the best reinforcing steel they had. Mm. And there's another point here too. The ICC allowed railroads to set rates based on the uh, cost of service including the value of the property that was used to provide the service. So the more money they put into their property, the higher rates they could charge. And in those days, they could charge essentially what they uh, get, what they charge because there's no competition. Uh, there's a big financial issue here in investing in the property. I'm going to sh uh, share now one of those bridges I was just telling you about. This is, I believe this was Bowser Road. Up on the uh, oh yeah, you know, where the Graham line and the main line came together. Mm. Um, you know, it was a multi-span uh, girder bridge that's since been replaced. Um, and give me a second here. Oh, I'm going to turn. I'm gonna, let, me, let me rotate here. There we go. <laughs> two girders from Mahoning Division, two girders <clears throat> from Southfields, a couple from Port Jervis, some from the car shop at Port Jervis, some at Meadville, some sort of Salamanca. That's what it went into. Now, again, this was an overhead bridge, right? A road over the railroad. So it did not have the uh, you know, same... Uh, you know, concern of carrying heavy freight traffic over it, obviously, but um, had to be resourceful, right? So it's a Frankenstein monster, huh? It's also a nice solid one, though, for highway use, since those are off of railroad bridges. So um, let me rotate it back now so you can see the whole, whole structure. Um, and let's see, what is the state to here? Nineteen twenty. Notice so, it's a wood roadway too. Yeah, December nineteen twenty, right? I guess the the one thing I'll say: work completed September second, nineteen twenty two. So, um, <laughs> what's what's interesting though is. But these were old pieces of steel from old bridges in 1920. How old were they? <laughs> a lot of that bridge material on, on the Erie, I've got records of that. A lot of that bridge material on the Erie came from the 1880s and 1890s and it was wrought iron. Okay, I'm going to find you one more and then we'll uh, take a few minutes a conversation here before. Uh, okay, show you. Um, and, and this is relevant to uh, the, the, the somewhat relevant to the territory we're going to be talking about tonight. So this was Ingracia Road. Ingracia. Ingracia, right, over the Graham Line, which is out, out almost to Howells Junction. Uh, here you see the, the two tracks, center line of the Erie and Jersey Railroad, right, the Graham Line. And here's the bridge. Truss Bridge, long since replaced. The interesting thing to me, one of the interesting things to me about this is...
There you go. Right here. This was one of the two pieces of the traveling crane <laughs> that was used in the construction of Moon Divida. It was deliberately designed to be reused after the construction was complete. Uh, the other bridge, I believe, that got the, the other half of the Traveler was out at, uh, oh my gosh, what's it called? Graham? Uh, right. What's that over, yeah. overhead bridge? Hey, uh yeah, the Guymard Turnpike. It was. Guymard, Guymard, yeah. That was the other that was the other place that where the other half of the traveler went. So does this mean that people in their time actually got to drive on Moodna Viaduct? <laughs> 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 because technically, you know, uh, I mean that's a lot of pretty construction cool. equipment. <laughs> yeah, but still it's pretty cool. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have guessed that. That bridge was gone by the time I got to the area, but the Bowser Road Bridge that you brought up a little bit ago, I've got some pictures here somewhere, and I never got the chance to scan them. I think they're from Marv Cohen. Uh, that bridge got taken out, at least on the on the north side, by Conrail, and then they re ended up rebuilding it before it got totally replaced within the last 15 or 20 years. Right. But they took a big chunk of that out on the Graham Line side. Doug, this is Steve Cowan. My memory is that a, a train hit it, derailed right. and hit it, hit the um, supports. Yeah, one of those went out, and it's in the Conrail, the uh, early Conrail era. All right. Um, you know, the one that I didn't think to have handy here. Um, but I'm sure many of you guys have seen this, but the, um, the bridge that's still there, it's closed to traffic, although you could walk across it if you're a you know, risk taker, at um, Shin Hollow, right? That's an overhead steel bridge, uh, fire road or something like that. The, the, the two beams for that bridge were actually originally a turntable. Uh, I believe you're right. In um, so supposedly, according to the drawings, Little Falls, New Jersey. I gather in the area, the wooded area there by the Little Falls Station at one time, there was a turntable. Um, because the, the drawings for that bridge are a drawing of a turntable and said used as, you know, bridge 82 point whatever. Um, and that's one that is still there and that you can, you can still see. Yeah, that was a pretty rickety bridge to drive over in the early 70s. Yeah, I walked across it a couple of years ago, and it's very rickety. It's closed off, you know. I mean, it was, <laughs> but I, I was I was there, took some pictures, and I I, I wanted to see it. So, so yeah, railroads were what was the term resourceful um, when it came to repurposing things. I'm sure Gordon Davids could give us stories of things that he saw over his many years in the railroad industry of. I well, I, I'll tell you, I, I saw something that really made me uh, understand the uh, economy of the Erie Railroad because they were very, very clever in reusing bridges. They took one, it was a double track, pin connected truss from Cambridge Springs. They brought it down to the Greenwood Lake Branch and I figured on replacing a bridge down there with it. It never happened. They moved it back up to the Mahoning Division. They cut it, they cut pieces out of it, made it a single track uh, through truss and uh, uh, I forget just where it's located. I inspected the Hong Kong thing about uh, 10 years ago. And uh, the Western New York and Pennsylvania moved their track over to it because it's a big, strong bridge. But that, that bridge had a real history. And by cutting it down from a double track to single track and actually cutting the floor beams and the, and the, the upper bracing system so that the, the trusses were moved in, uh, it became a very, very strong bridge for carrying mm -hmm. one track instead of two. Uh, they were very clever that way. That, that's in Waterboro, New York. Waterboro, that's correct. Yeah, and it's it's humorous when you go up there now. It, the tracks are in an S curve, so they go from the original alignment. They uh, have an S curve north, go over the Buffalo and Southwestern Bridge, and then curve right back over to the main line. 
They did that on my suggestion because the bridge on the eastbound track was uh, no longer viable. And the reason for that was because of all the eastbound refrigerator traffic, especially with meat. The brine drippings on that bridge had deteriorated the floor system so badly that it was beyond repair. And I suggested to the management of the Western New York and Pennsylvania, it would be cheaper to realign the track over the bridge that was out of service than to try to rebuild the one they had. That okay, was after folks, I retired from the FRA. I'm going to share just one more quick drawing only because it's, um, it's got a couple of points of interest to it. And then we'll get on to Doug's presentation. Oh. Harney Junction, right? This is the, the, the sort of tiny little tower built up on the PRR overhead bridge over the Marstown line. Um, really small. <laughs> and uh, the, the one bit of information here that, that uh, I only learned by like looking through this drawing is, give me a second here, I'm sorry to give you all seasick looking at the drawing. Oh, here we go. Uh, June 6th, 1910, okay, drawn, Neil and Botts. Botts is the famous, or well, somewhat famous architect that worked for the Lackawanna, William Hull Botsford who later perished in the Titanic sinking. Wow. Oh. He, he, um, he designed uh, several stations. Uh, the Tabor histories, Tabor referred to him as the Lackawanna's young chief architect. I think that's false. Um, Frank Nyes was the chief architect before Botsford was there and after he left. I think Botsford was just, a, you know, one of the staff of architects at a time when the railroad was really busy, right? 1910, thereabouts, they were doing lots of things. And so uh, I have found, oh, a dozen or so locations maybe that you'll see this, he, you know, he used BOTS instead of his, more traditionally would be what WHB would be the, what you'd see somebody use for the initials. He used bots. So, I, in any event. I noticed these are dated 1910. Do I recall that this tower was not built until 1921? Couldn't tell you. That I don't know. Anybody remember that being a restaurant? Carney Junction? For Jersey, New Jersey mosquitoes. The operators hated to work that place because they <laughs> were a source of blood supply for the mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, enough of. Uh, our preamble here, um, we're, we're happy to have Doug Barbario back to finish or take us further west uh, on our progression up the main line of the Erie in Orange County, New York. Let's, uh, and, let's see if I can get it cracking. Uh, um, had nothing but problems the last few times. Let's see. Our, our, the way we've been oh. handling this and it's worked pretty well is if you guys could just type your questions into the chat and then we'll we'll take a pause halfway through and go through all the questions that we have at that point. And, but that way, Doug doesn't, you know, loses the flow of his presentation. And, um, and you know, if you have to drop off, that's fine. Uh, we're happy you're okay. here with us tonight and uh, look forward to okay. the next time as well. Perfect, Doug. You Perfect. got it? Okay. Yes. Okay, a couple of things before we get started. <clears throat> this program uh, was not that big uh, before Jeff contacted me, and it's it's about 260 slides for an area of the railroad that's probably less than half of what we already covered. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, a wealth of information. The further you move west, a lot of the local photographers, of course, this is their home area. And two, um, there's that much more interesting things going on with these branches connecting to the main line. So about half the program is probably about Goshen because you actually have the branch cut right through the main line from one side, the Pine Island branch, the other side, the Montgomery branch. So um, I'm, I'm 
I didn't intend it to get that large, but I'm, as I'm working on it intermittently with things going on here at the house, and I finally looked at it and said, oh, my gosh, this is, you know, this is like a coaching program. So um, that's that's how it's kind of been developed, although I did spend a lot of time at Great Court. So because I had some information from Mr. Stellwagen. So there's the same people that uh, basically helped put this program together, all their uh, photography, which is my eyes since I never saw any of this for the most part. And it's still dedicated to the three gentlemen who I mentioned the last time, Ray Brown, Marv Cohen, and Mr. John Stellwagen. And that's Mr. Stellwagen. And this is one of my favorite pictures because <laughs> it's got Marv Cohen <laughs> and Ray Brown. Uh, and I, I would imagine he hopped up on the engine to get up here. This is up North Street in Middletown. And there's a little better shot of Ray. Uh, he worked for the MNNJ, as you can tell. So um, a lot of his collection of paperwork was centered around Middletown, but he did have a, a fair amount of material that helped out in this program, even though not necessarily photographic wise. And here's Marv Cohen, which Steve uh, corrected me on once before. This is in a German steam locomotive, which is one of my favorite images that Steve has shared with me with his father, because it looks like he's running the show. And uh, in a lot of ways he was, and he is. So this picture, I believe, was taken from uh, Mr. Bob Collins. He was with a crew of people out there. I think Don Furler might have been out there, too, if I look, remember looking at his collection. And this is a K52935 with the westbound, just the west side of Oxford Depot. And it was in the program, I think, the last time, but I couldn't uh, not have it back in to get us started off because it's just uh, an amazing picture. And here's K52930 leaving train nine. You'll notice all the milk cars in roughly the same position. And they're both approaching Great Court at, at great speed. Now, this is roughly where we're going to cover tonight. Great Court is down here. Chester. We've got a fair amount of track until we get to Goshen. And uh, I'll point out to you later that Goshen and Middletown have a lot in common in terms of their overall track layout. This is the, uh, the Montgomery branch up here. We're going to go almost to this exact spot because this is just outside the village. And this is where it crosses Route 207. And this is also just outside the village here where uh, the railroad ducks under what would eventually become Route 17M today. And so most of the branch look is going to be within this mile or two here. And we'll look a little bit at the LNHR and um, a little tiny bit on the Newburgh branch because that's pretty tough to get stuff on. So here we are in Great Court. And you're coming in. This is coming in from Oxford Depot. You have your Y, this is off the Newburgh branch maps, your main line, and your Newburgh branch. There was a little yard over here, and there was a, two bridges, one here and one here. I went back there about the early 2000s. Both bridges were there. Uh, one on the, outs on the inside actually had ties on it. I think I have a picture of it later on in the first part of the program. And then, of course, you had Great Court Yard, which is where there's the big connection with the LNHR. In the early years, prior to the Poughkeepsie Bridge, the LNHR was bringing a lot of traffic here, which was brought up the Newburgh Branch and then ferried across the Hudson River. Even in the later years, though, there's still a lot of traffic here for the Erie Lackawanna, in particular with the photographs that I have, to interchange with. And I assume some of it went up the Newburgh Branch. Cars were also dropped for the New in this area, and they were left here. I don't know if they were left here in the yard, but it's 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 just, you know it's possible. The job that came out of Newburgh pretty much came at night, so um, it's very plausible that they went in there. Here's now I, I took a guess on this. It's not the Middletown drill, and I didn't get a chance to change with things going here. Those of you who know my dog was in the hospital; he's been sick for a week or so. Um, but this 280 is definitely on the main line. The water plug and the signal completely match up on the maps where this is located. And these tracks back here are the beginning of the south or the west leg of the Y on the Newburgh Bridge. And that's the flatlands that's located in the area. There's a lot of black dirt in this area and farming area, not unlike what's on the Pine Island Bridge. 
Now, this is looking from the LNHR's bridge, and this is one of the few ghostly images, if I have, of the tower, which was GB. Um, this disappeared, I believe, after the Graham line came into existence because it just doesn't show up. But there she is. Those are the tracks we were looking at here. There's a couple of cars on it, begin the Newburgh Branch and the water tank that's down here, which I think shows up in a subsequent map that'll show you the yard. This is the LNHR that's coming in. She's got a three track stub ended track yard here, along with double ended yard here, which interchange with the Erie and eventually Erie Lackawanna. And the Great Court Station was, was a bit ornate, a little larger in these images than it will be later on. Now that's what the, the Great Court Depot looked like. The main building here, and you had a baggage room, I believe, and a waiting room, or we've got them reversed. The depot was GC, and the, uh, the tower call letters was GB. Here's another view of it. Now, right in the back here, if you look, you can see the overpass of the Lehigh and Hudson River that goes right over there, tracks coming off from Hudson Junction to come in and do the interchange. Here's a backside view. These are the LNHR tracks here. The first track here is leading into the Erie, Erie Lackawanna yard. This is going into the three track yard uh, that was stub ended for the Lehigh and Hudson. And I think you can still barely make out the bridge here in the background. There's an Erie passenger train here at the depot. Look at how well dressed everybody is. Here we have a westbound passenger train with 2753 and the depot is just out of sight to the right. I can't see everything on my screen so I have to kind of keep this off to the side here. You can clearly see the water tank that was down located by the Y though. It's an excellent image of that. And the farmland to the left. Very flat area, this particular region. Now, here's where we were roughly with that 280 picture. The water tank and the water crane are right in here, along with the signal. GB Tower is here. Your Great Court Depot is here. Your LNHR main scooting straight across. The Erie Freight House, ironically, is on the other side of the bridge for as long as it lasted. And then there was a two trip two track one being a runaround uh, for the LNHR to come down from Hudson Junction. In this area that's not shown, which is not on the Erie maps, in this area here was a turntable for the LNHR. And uh, I forget who had sent it to me. Two, two gentlemen, Rich and I forget the other gentleman because it's been a long day. Um, actually had a, a, a copy of a map from 1903 Atlas and I just couldn't get around to getting it in the program with things going on here. But the turntable was there. So here's a view of the station. It's been cut down considerably. Your Erie yard, and this is the LNHR portion of the yard. There's like four or five tracks in here. And there was another water plug, of course, down here from the water tank. That's the bridge over the LNHR, and the steam and the smoke is obscuring the larger girder bridge that went over the Erie main. And this is all a fill here, the LNHR. Right behind it is Black Dirt Onion Country. This was for the Barrager collection, which I found, which is an excellent shot. Now, the tower is gone, but it does show you the water tank, the water plug, the yard, and you're looking straight ahead. And, uh, you know, the relative agricultural nature of the area, um, pretty good shot. The station's been cut down, though. The ends of the station were removed on September 30th, 1937. So most of us think of Great Court as you see it here. And here's an Erie Pacific coming in a K1. One thing interesting, I, when I uh, put this program together, I had the image scanned and I'm like, oh, I must have messed up. Look at all this missing. This stuff is hanging in, you know, midair. I'm, I'm going to have to rescan it and fix it. <laughs> into the photograph. That's exactly how it is. It wasn't anything on my part. So whoever developed it, the actual connecting here for the telltale just didn't show up in the photograph. And I thought it was me. Now, this track is curving and starting to go up great to Chester in the background. Now, here's a pretty famous view because you've got a fan trip here. I believe this fan trip, because it's a pretty rainy day, uh, also went up the Pine Bush branch because right around the same time, I've got an image of those two cars at the Pine Bush station on the same 
type of miserable day that this turned out to be. And you've got the Erie Limited coming in. The station, there's still some passengers here, but look where they're waiting now. They don't have the overhangs. So that's right under the eaves of what's left of the station. And you can see the yard here. And whoever took it is literally on the Lehigh and Hudson River Bridge looking down. So the water plug was, you know, right below it. At least this one was. This is a Stellwagen shot with PA coming through. And by now the station's all boarded up. This track was used for the Newburgh branch. Westbound, eastbound Maine. What's not very clear here on the right is the LNHR tracks. It's somewhat obscured in the image. This is all Mr. Stellwagen also. This is the connecting track here for the Erie to connect with the LNHR when they do connect. And that's the track that comes from the LNHR in front of the station. It's the same train, front and back. Mr. Stellwagen was at the end of the platform. And of course, the tower would have been somewhere right in here, but of course, now long gone. And he could have this shot during EL days, E8 coming through. But look at how many cars are off to the side here. I don't think this is all for the Newburgh branch. I really don't. This is interchange traffic. So there was a fair amount of traffic still coming here. Now, one of the stories I got from the guys on the MNJ was once the Hanford branch got ripped out and certain traffic for the feed mills for the Middletown, New Jersey couldn't come up via the Susquehanna, the stuff was coming up on the LNHR left here and then the area was bringing it to Middletown, some of it. So that can account for some of the traffic. This is also Mr. Stellwagen, a couple of great, I wish you got a front shot of it, but the uh, Erie Limited, this should have been train one. I got train two there. Um, so that's an error, it should be train one. And he's standing on what looks like the Erie yard, the LNHR tracks are here and he caught it going by and then going directly under. So I'll have to make a change there. It's a nice, pretty nice shots of the of the area, even at this time. Now, while he was there, he would also capture the Lehigh and Hudson coming up. This is a long fill to get up and over the right of way there and up onto the hill where Hudson Junction is. This drops pretty well all the way out towards Craigville before it starts winding its way through the hills towards uh, Maybrook. Here's another view of the same train. And then the one you probably are remembering from being published in a couple of magazines is this one. You're looking straight up to Chester. The track is curving through the black dirt. And these RS3s are each on the LNHR overpass portion and the Erie portion. And again, the station's been boarded up now. It's, you know. That's a beautiful shot Mr. Stellwagen got. And that wasn't the only one he got. He got that one too at the hind end of it. So he just moved over and he got that. I seem to think that this picture and the other one were published for whatever reason in one of um, Ed Chris' books with the LNHR that comes to mind. Now, this is also Mr. Stellwagen catching a commuter coming in. And you notice how clear this is. Eventually, there'll be some oil tanks and some other things that got in here in later years. Now, the freight house, which would be obscured by the engine, was literally the other side of the bridge. But by now, it's long gone. And this is the track that leads for the Newburgh branch crew. Now, there was a fan trip on June 4th, 1961. And it was Erie, Lackawanna, one PA and two-tone Erie paint, the other one in the new merger scheme. And this is coming up on the fill. Unfortunately, he didn't, for whatever reason, get the shot on the bridge. But this was in his negative collection. Also in his collection, which is kind of nice, is he got this camelback shot, of course, much earlier. But what it does show is the Hudson Junction area, because it's this track right here to the left that's going to go down to the black dirt. You can barely see the Erie right away in the background because it curves around. And this is all black dirt. In these years, it was mainly onions. Now they've had to diversify with the changing climate and the flooding we've gotten this and that. So they have a variety of products. And not all of this is being farmed anymore. Some of it's sod farms, but not everybody's using all the properties anymore. 
So this is actually under the bridge on the LNHR looking into the yard. Notice the telltales totally came out in this picture, which is nice. And here's a view. He just walked out, which is I kind of like because you start to get different views of it. There's a stone retaining wall here. This track is still there today. The MNNJ who currently operates this still has two team tracks. And I had a couple of pictures of Conrail in the 80s coming in here and switching refrigerated cars uh, for bagged onions and such. And I, I just couldn't find it in time to get it in the program. But uh, this is the one track that's still here. Everything on the other side is there. Trail now. And you can see the station's pretty much worn. But this is the switch here that separates from going into the LNHR yard or the Erie yard. Here's another view looking back. All these are Mr. Stellwagen. All of them are Mr. Stellwagen. What's left of the platform on the right. And you get up on the bridge, so even at this late date, you can actually get a pretty good view of the yard. I'm not sure if this track comes all the way through. It doesn't look like it, but one, two, three, four, five tracks. At this point in time, everything I've looked at, all these negatives, this looks like instead of being three tracks now, they just left the longest one. There's only one. So this is the remain, as you can see, the open area of what the LNHR had a three-track yard near. Here's the Newburgh branch coming off. And of course, the water tank is long gone. It's along with the depot. Now, Stellwagen got on Great Court Avenue, which is just the other side of the main line. The bridge is actually right behind him. And I didn't think to add, I have pictures of that bridge. I just recalled it. And this is, it's coming in at grade. This road takes you right into Chester as you're looking here. And there was at one point two, two tracks in this area for a runaround track. But here are C420s. Again, it's relatively late, another year or so or less. They're gonna, the bridge is going to burn, and a lot of things are going to change around here for the LNHR. But 21, 28, and 27 are coming in. And here they are going across the crossing. Now, behind this house back here, which is not really easy to see, is roughly where that turntable would have been located. Here she is coming under the bridge. We'll tank here at this point in time. And he's throwing the switch to get into the yard, which we saw earlier. And going into the yard. So she'll run around her cars, pick up some stuff from the Erie, or Erie like a one at the time, build her train, and uh, go back up and reattach. At this point in time, and I have some images forthcoming, the LNHR was switching this on their way back from Maybrook, leaving the train often on top of the bridge, which you could see while this was going on. Uh, I think in the early years at Steam, what ended up happening is they ran a local up here because they did have the runaround tracks here in the yard, the turntable, which would uh, make it much easier to do rather than leaving cars there. And they had much more traffic in those days. And the siding might have been used for passing trains, particularly during the war with the traffic they were carrying. And somehow John got right on top of the bridge. And he's got one shot with this further out. He's got this shot. And this guy was moving pretty fast because the next shot of the sequence, the train is on top of him. So he must have been moving at a 50, 60 mile an hour clip. But here he is. You can see the difference in the span. This is over the LNHR. This is over the Erie Lackawanna. Those are the Erie Lackawanna tracks. So you can't see the LNHR, which is down below this bit of a cut here. But you can see some of the farmland. And the crops growing out there. Now, this is also from Stellwagen's collection. It's 95 coming down. You can see the two tracks, and you can barely make out the LNHR track fill right in here going into Great Court. And as you can see, it's all black dirt. All black dirt. Now, one of the reasons, I don't know why it was called Hudson Junction, but in putting the program together, I said, you know, what's the name of the street? I was scanning some of his negatives for other reasons and, you know, before I used the program. And I looked, of course, the street right next to where the switch is is called Hudson Street. So perhaps that's part of the reason it's called Hudson Junction or the fact that in the early years, the traffic went down to the yard and actually was ferried across the Hudson. But for whatever reason, Hudson Street is right next to Hudson Junction. 
Here's number 27 about to depart the yard. Got a young Ralph fan here. And here she is coming back up. This is Hutchin Junction. Now, there is another track here that we saw earlier, but it's pretty well obscured by the weeds at this. And it drops pretty quick because you can see the difference in the height of where he left this train to where he is now. He's got quite a grade. This is Hudson Street over here. And as now you can see the other track. And the C420 is returning to their train. Almost at the switch for Hudson Junction. On the switch, it's almost live action the way he shot it. And now they've pulled clear and they're going to put their train away, uh, together rather. And here they are heading back. We're different date, but you get the idea. And this, of course, is Hudson Street here. So pretty good if you went here for a uh, rail fanny, actually. Literally park your car right next to the junction. And it's not that far of a walk, but he got these on somewhat different days. And I think what he did is he took his car. He could, you can drive up and get back down to Great Court without the traffic being like what it is today. And to shoot some of the other shots he took earlier. Uh, because there probably wasn't even a light that's there today. And here's another view of the trains coming by. So thankfully he was there to get, uh, you know, get these images. And this is what, you know, would have been done on a regular basis in steam days. Just that unfortunately we don't have that many images of that. Now this is what I was mentioning about leaving it. These are, I think, Dave Augsburger. Uh, here's the train on top of the bridge. And he's coming out of Great Court. And the yard is behind him. And the Erie Main Line is on the other side of this support for the bridge. And here's a view looking in the yard. Note there's a couple of cars here on the Newburgh branch. One of the inside track on the Y, or the outside track, if you will. I think in the subsequent pictures, there's going to be some cars left on the third track up here, the Newburgh branch. The yard's got quite a bit of stuff in it. There's quite a few cars here, considering, you know, the years it's taken. It's in the early 70s. And here we are again. A couple more views. Thankfully, Dave Augsburger was there to photograph it. And now the only thing left today is this what this engine is on and two of these tracks. Everything else is gone. This is the Heritage Trail. You wouldn't recognize it. And there are usually some cars left, and the tracks go down pretty far. Uh, almost to the bridge that goes over over a, a brook down there, if I recall correctly. In fact, I think I did manage to get a picture of that in here so, subsequently. Uh, notice these cars left for the Newburgh branch over here in the third track. This is April 7, 1973. So even though this is a pretty late date, I was pleasantly surprised to see this much activity. So uh, for, for uh, some modelers, I, I can think of... Uh, one gentleman, uh, first name of, escapes me at the moment, but uh, Mike Quinn it is. Uh, Mike Quinn was built at the Newburgh branch, and if he did, this would be something, regardless of his error, that he could include and have a lot of activity here, along with the Newburgh branch proper. Now, this is something I shot not that many years ago. This is the main line, and these are the two remaining tracks that are left there. I wish I had included my Conrail pictures, but they were not digitized. These were digital pictures. So it was a lot easier to find them. Now, I think these are Dennis Carpenters. He's got a train. I'm not sure if it's coming in or out. Um, but there's a tr the Middletown drill, most likely, coming in to go up to the uh, Newburgh, because in those late days it did. You can clearly see the black dirt in the background, and you've got a train on the LNHR. You got a train on the Erie. He's actually standing on the portion of the bridge that's uh, over the LNHR connection to Great Court Yard. The turntable would have been up in here. Uh, I wish I'd included the map that the gentleman gave me, and I just couldn't get around to it, this craziness here. Here's another shot, switching. And I think I have two shots of the Newburgh Bridge coming. I had some other images of it, but uh, they're further up the line than Great Court. I didn't see the point in going that far up. It's hard to get images of this, particularly since many years the job was a night job. 
Now, this came to me, I think it might be Dennis Carpenter. It is the Conrail era, as you can tell by the caboose. But this is that first bridge I mentioned that comes off the Y. You can see the cars here on the main, on the third track. And this was still there when I went and walked it. This was, of course, in much worse shape than that. And the bridge behind me is still there. Uh, I'm surprised they didn't scrap it up. But the Newburgh branch is a bit of an anomaly. Most of the bridges, except for one over Jackson Avenue, they're all there. Uh, I don't know why they weren't scrapped out, but they are. That's what it looked like when I walked in. This is almost, let me just go back. This is almost standing in the same place. And that's the Heritage Trail. And if you look close, you can see what's left. Looks like some ties of one or two remaining tracks uh, coming out of Great Court that are still there because they go almost the whole length of this area. But this is what it looked like in 2006. So God knows what it looks like, you know, 16 years later. Here we have a passenger train coming in. You can see the track for the Newburgh Branch. And this is, of course, the bridge of the LNHR. It's May of 74. I have to correct that. It should be uppercase. Clear view up to Chester, uh, Chester, though. You're going to go up grade to get there. And then one taken off the bridge. And again, you can see the greenery, lots of onions, uh, corn, all kinds of local produce. In fact, for many years, even when the railroad was gone, I would drive up Great Court Avenue, and there were several farm stands here in the 80s and early 90s, regularly open during the week to pick up fresh produce on the way home from work in, in May and early September and October when I was returning from the college. This is the switch, of course, for the third track for the Newburgh Bridge. Now, here's Chester. Unfortunately, I didn't get to annotate this. Here's the station, the freight house. There was a tower here. A tower? Yeah, there was a tower. I don't know how long it lasted. It doesn't show up in the 1903 Telegrapher's book, but it was labeled CS. And I believe these pictures are taken from that tower because they're elevated. And what would you be up on to take these pictures from? Now, this is Route 94 which would be eventually rebuilt, which we'll see in a little bit. These are the team and the yard tracks going into Chester proper. And note that house, it's gonna show up in a lot of photographs. It's in the perfect place. Now here's the proof. I wish it was a better picture. There's the tower and I did get one that was a little better. They were very low, low resolution, but I blew them up best I could. CS, right here. There's the Chester station. So there was a tower there, surprisingly. And I guess in the early years, you needed one just about every place for switches. Uh, but I'm surprised, again, by 1903, it's not on the telegraphers list, so God knows when this picture was taken. But it has to predate that publication. Now, in this postcard view, there's the tower again, CS Tower. And this is on the main line, and the... Yeah, Engine is on this side of the bridge and steam is obscuring uh, what would become Route 94. And this isn't quite a bit of a cut and they would reinforce it because judging from these postcard shots, it looks like the ground is just by itself. There'd be some stone placed right in this area to support it because it's really in a steep grade. And you can notice the water here, it's always a wet spot. You walk through in the Heritage Trail, unless it's a real hot, dry summer, there's water in this cut. Now, there were some um, local places here that got uh, fresh meat, and I think it was pork, uh, and that's what these cars are here for. I got this shot from uh, Bob Panisi. And this is the original depot. I say original because it's not the one that's there today. Now, in the later years, in, in 1903 Telegraph's uh, book, this becomes CS. So I was a little surprised when I got those shots of the tower. And a couple of views of the depot. There's our house again, notice right here up on the hill. Still there today. Of course, now there's a new structure here. I think what they did is they took part of the structure and it became a new freight house because it tends to look at it with the eaves like it might be what's left of this when they were, uh, took it down. They didn't completely take it down. And here's the depot 1909. Nice looking structure. Typical bay window. 
And this is not the best quality, but I believe a Bob Collins shot of train 83 coming in. But that makes me think it might be what's left of the, of, of the station. This window also matches the side window on the station. So it might be the remnants of the original station that was made into the freight house. This is the new station with the Spanish tile here. And notice there's a wall here, which wasn't in the earlier images and postcards. Now I managed to catch this shot, and I don't remember where I got it from, of a work train coming through, which is interesting because there's a Vandy tender behind the crane, and this has got a standard tender. I wish I got a better look at the engine. I'm guessing it might be a 280. But you can clearly see here the wall that was built to support the sides of the cut. And that's the station that's there today. This is the new Route 94 bridge. I think it was built in the 40s. I, I had a shot of it and I can't find it. I had the, the actual date on it. And it's been, um, you know, cleaned up and restored to some effect. And the Chester Historical Society meets there. I've actually given a program or two there over the years. And they're really nice people. Of course, things have changed with our unfortunate pandemic. But you can still visit it. And I think they used to have it open on Saturdays which if you were walking down the Heritage Trail was kind of nice that you could actually go into that depot. Of course, you can go into one of the other depots. The last one that we'll look at is, is Goshen, but I'm not so sure you want to go into it. Here's another view in 65, nice shot of it. And 74 it's, it's got a little more character on this side with the stone area here to drop people off it's like a little area to drive through in the early years you could have done it with a car not with our cars today i don't think you see the retaining wall here and here i think these tracks are slightly super elevated myself i've always thought so based on the photographs and a snowy day there's our house again telltales you're not sure where it is. That house is there, you do know. It's in an interesting place. These are some pictures I took with my little rickety digital camera uh, in the early years. And there's that house again of the depot as it looked once they restored it. And people sometimes park here and they'll bike up to Monroe, which now they can go as far down to Harriman, or they'll bike up to Chester, which now they can go up to Six and a Half Station Road. The rest of the main line into Middletown, I think, is still under construction uh, for the trail. And then we've got some shots coming. This is the lead track to the Chester Yard area, August 6, 1966. Got to be some kind of power move. This is uh, quite a few, few locomotives on this train 21. And likewise here, there's uh, four engines on this one. This is at first coming into town, and this is it's going by. These are Mr. Stellwagen shots. Again, notice the agricultural region. You can't even get this view now because there's so many trees that have grown up here. Even on a nice walk on the trail, you have to get out pretty far to be able to view that. It's all obscured with the foliage along the right of way. And this is that train that just passed us going through. Then John managed to capture this one. I don't know if it was before or earlier, I had to lighten it up a little bit, but you clearly see stone supports here. They had some concrete here and then more stone because of the problems they were having in the cut. Now this freight house is long gone. And these came from Railroad Avenue Enterprises, but I think Stellwagen took them. Train 21 through Chester in 62. Oh, we got a dupe. I didn't realize I had a dupe in there. Yeah, it is super relevant. I had two dupes. I didn't realize I had them. Same train, larger picture. So I think the first one was supposed to be out, so you got a better view of this. All right, this is John up on the Route 94 bridge, and you're actually looking into the cut. So you can clearly see that wall I was describing to you, at least on the eastbound side. The station, there's that house I was talking about, only from a different angle and the black dirt area in the chested area here. And John luckily caught a train. Again, this is all trail now, but you got stone. You can see the stone for the wall here as there was stone here. 
And every time I've gone on the trail, which is usually fall or spring, and it's been a number of years, both sides of this, I forget which piece is paved. I think it's this piece. There's always water running in here. Excuse me, I've got to have a drink. John caught another image of the same train. He just panned the camera. And they got to go in a way shot. Now, just out of sight here, in this area here, behind these trees, across the Heritage Trail, which surprised me they did it, and they had to go through several hearings to do it, they put the new Chester High School. And that's where the Chester High School resides today. So I forget the name of the street that pans by there, and you go right by the trail, but Chester High School is right in there. Now, John got in that same neck of the woods here, and he caught this. The closer he got to Goshen, the more pictures there are from Mr. Stellwagen. Obviously, he's close to home. And he caught these, which came out really nice. Train 71. And what, what I really liked was not just this shot. I was going to make them two slides, but I said these pictures are just too good. I really liked that one going away into the curve. There was something majestic about it to me. But not to be outdone, he did catch a little freight work. And this is probably the local, perhaps the pickup with two Jeeps coming through roughly the same area. August 4, 73. I don't know if anybody's seen some of these shots because uh, I don't, unless he had them with the other camera, which he sold his negatives to Bob Panisi, I think a, a lot of them, uh, maybe nobody's seen these. I don't know. Now, this is Old Chester Road Bridge, and it was falling apart. But John took, I don't know, a dozen images at least of this bridge. It's all filled in now. So when you come here, the trail has to come up to the height of the road, which is probably about here now. They've cut it down and then goes back down a grade. Um, this is all totally filled in. So he took these shots 77, so Conrail's running what's left of the EL at this point in time. But he did manage to shoot the bridge, and I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, off that bridge is probably where these two shots are taken, because you notice you're elevated. And if you're looking here, and you're driving up, notice there's no Route 17 now. This is 17. What's in this area today? Anybody want to go to Legoland? That's where it is. It's up in this hill. So this view, you're looking back towards Chester. This view, you're looking up towards Goshen. Stellwagen did the same thing. He's got train one coming in this direction. Off that bridge, and he pan the camera and got it going away. And again, at this time, 1960, doesn't seem to be 17 here if, include, if the date on this camera is right. It's old 17, which kind of surprises me. But that's the date on his information. Now, in this image, it looks like there might be the road there. So why I don't have it, whoop, let me just go back. Why I don't see it here, I don't know unless it's below it and I can't see it. Uh, which is possible because it's pretty close to the same time. But here it almost looks like I have it. So it might be just a matter of the terrain blocking a view here. This has been so changed in the last few years. I mean, you can't look through here now. There's the Great Wall of China that I call it, where they built such a high exit for Legoland that you can't see across to see the highway. This is the straight stretch at 17M parallels. And it's a wonderful portion on the trail. It's upgrade all the way, but it's a beautiful area. To, to walk or bike. Lots of people take this from Goshen to Chester and back. Now, John got on the other side on Chester Road and shot this. So 17M and 17 would be on the other side of this image, which you can't see. Legoland is up on this hill. Just to give you an idea what it looks like today, it's not that anymore. Now you can see 17 here. 17M is obscured by the fill, and he managed to capture one of the passenger trains coming on the straight stretch. And I made a point of pointing out this large stone culvert 
it's one of the few uh, remaining things here that you can see. And it's tough because the trees are growing up in this area on both sides. But that culvert was one of the items that I used to see when I drove home from work all the time. Deliberately slowed down if there was nobody behind me to just get a view of it. This is beautiful stonework. And he took a second shot, and there it is. Same train. And it's pretty big size. Pretty substantial science culvert. That's my shadow, and I managed to take a shot of this. I don't have the date, but even at that time, the trees are starting to cover this all up. I think you'd drive a small car through it. The next road or path over it is Duck Pond uh, Road, and it still crosses the Heritage Trail today. And John managed to catch Jeep 35 and a U25B here in 1966. So you're getting much closer to Goshen. Matter of fact, the next crossing is going to be South Street. You'll be in Goshen. Oh, where is it? Here we go. Is it going? There we go. Oh, I'm not clicking. Oh, before I get there, I have to discuss this. A lot of talk about why the Graham Line was built and a lot of reasons. Most of you know what they are. But one of them was that they had a plan of going around Goshen and Middletown because they were both horseshoe-shaped trackage. And they were both going up grade and they both had clearance problems. So the reason I included this map is this is a purchased land on the Erie Val maps of the proposed cutoff to go right across and not ever go into Goshen at all, which is exactly what they were going to do in Middletown and bypass the entire Horseshoe, DW Yard, and all that, and just go straight up Middletown Summit, simplifying the operation for through trains. Uh, they never did it, of course, because they built the Graham Line and that solved their problems. But on this map and the map that proceed, uh, follows the Goshen Val map as well, also has this indication of where the cutoff is. It's not on the ones for Middletown, but it is on the ones for Goshen. And interestingly enough, this is pretty close to where the highway ended up going today. Now, I included this map of Middletown, even though it's not a Middletown program. Notice the horseshoe and DW yard here. And the problem is it's upgrading this clearance. Here's what Goshen looks like. It's quite similar. South Street here and a big horseshoe. And then it's going to curve out at the bottom. The Goshen map is actually there's another portion of the yard down here, the way they drew it. But it's also a horseshoe with clearance problems. So that's part of the reason I, I think they were coming up with this idea of having the cutoff. And then when they decided to build the Graham line, it solved almost all their problems in that regard. And that was dropped. But they were going to cut off. So you wouldn't have had to go into Goshen here, nor would you have to just go back. Middletown, this would have been totally cut off. The Erie would have went off the page here and connected past the yard. But they didn't do that. They built the Graham line instead. Now, this is the Montgomery branch, which we'll show you better here. Church Street, Grand Street here, which the Montgomery branch crosses, and also a little bit of Canal Street. The Goshen Depot is here. A lot of close clearance in this area, which Greenwich Street, Main Street. Turntables down here. Uh, GP Towers down in this area here. And it's pretty tight, but most of the action in Goshen takes place on this side. The trail is very nice in here. You park your car actually on the trail up in this area in order to walk down. So this is a view in from South Street, looking into the beginning of what is the horseshoe of Goshen. And that's one of its many churches. And I guess this is during the Direco era because here you got a, a C420 from D&H going across, going westbound into uh, Goshen. This is South Street. It looks pretty much the same today. It goes over 17. There's a light down here now because the highway where this is curving, the highway goes cuts right across through here, which is roughly where the cutoff would have been to connect to the other side of um, Goshen. And John caught a local coming out. That house is still there. And this is the beginning of the problems. It's September 13th, 1966. These buildings are very, very close and very tight. This building did have a siding. It's long been removed. 
It's a parking lot now. In fact, I believe this part of the right of way you drive your car on to park your car for the trail. And all this is a parking area. I did manage to find this. You can see the remains of one of the switches here. Timbers. And that building, which still exists, is one of the big problems with clearance. It's still there today. All this is gone. Much of this has been removed. That's pretty tight in here. It's pretty tight. Now cars park. It's always a through driveway to get from one side of town to the other. I think it's one way, though. Uh, I think I have a picture or two coming up of what it looks like today. You'd never know you were here today because of so many of the buildings being removed. Here's just another view of it coming in. Notice those buildings that we just looked at moments ago. What's here and what's gone. Even those buildings are gone now. Now, there's the building in 2006, 2004. Here's your right of way and the cars I mentioned in Elk Park. That's what it looks like. I often will park my car, if not here, behind me on the next street because the Goshen Station is the Goshen Police Station. So you can always go in and get a tour of it, but I'm not so sure you want to go in there unless you ask for a tour. This recently came into my possession. It's a great shot. That's that building. So let's just get it straight. This is right here. Here's the gate tower. Notice the gas stations. This is, I believe, where that other building was, which would, you know, is not the one you see here in the picture. This is looking to the five corner intersection here. All these buildings still remain. Totally different today. Never know it. All this is gone. Uh, there's a bank here, and that's it. It's pretty open. Now, John Stellwagen went a little further back. There's that building again. And he did manage to catch one train. It's the only thing I found in his collection here on Greenwich Street in the area of Lackawanna days in RS3, probably with a commuter train cutting across. I love the signs. Highland ice cream, groceries, gas station signs, Buick. Now you're looking in. Recognize this. All these buildings are gone. And you're looking in at the Goshen Depot. In a moment, we'll have a break. There's one picture in particular I'm going to stop at. Here you're coming into the station. Again, this is the Goshen Police Station today. And this is the West Main Street. It used to be Main Street, but it's West Main Street crossing. And here's looking back across West Main Street. These buildings still exist. And that's the Occidental Hotel, which burned. And another view of the buildings. John shot this like he was going to model. This is just a small portion of what he shot. But John lived, by the way, in Goshen. So you, that's the reason, the main reason. A PA coming through town. He's got a, a few PAs coming through town. Here's an Erie Lackawanna train, 57, coming through. And what's interesting, how tight is the curve? Here's the front. There's the other part of the train in the back curving around our famous building. Again, that's the eastbound track, but it's, it's a pretty tight curve. And that was one of their problems. In the early years, it wasn't a big problem. That's what that area looks like now, or relatively now. They've widened it a little bit and parking on one side. You never know. It's one way this way towards West Main Street. And there's our clearance problem and the other parking I showed you before. So, it's, you know, if you didn't know better and you're just driving through town, you might not think there was a railroad there at all. Here's John's got train 57 at 6.10 p.m. He wrote then, August 1973. And at this point, this is about midway through the program. I'm going to pause. Uh, a mother daughter, which I love this picture, have just watched the train 59 cross over. 
and now they're going to go take your bike ride uh, across the street. Notice the original Volkswagen over there, too. Most of these buildings, except for the Occidental Hotel, which is there on the right, are all the same. There's a lot of small businesses, a lot of nice restaurants in town, too. Of course, hours and everything have changed due to the COVID situation. But it's a pretty good town. It's the county seat. And um, I like to go there to have dinner there with my wife when things are normal, which they haven't been. Uh, but, the, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful town, Goshen. It really, really is. So I think this is slide like 130 or 131. And uh, it's about halfway through our program. That means the rest of the half of the program is going to be from about here to the outskirts of town. And we've got the two branches to look at, which are on the other side. Okay, Doug, um, let me throw a few questions that have come in out at you uh, or comments. Uh, Robert Crone, I saw the June 4th, 1961 trip, fan trip of the PAs at Waldwick. Okay. Um, I don't know what the entire routing was. Uh, interesting. I wonder if that's, there, there have been pictures of, of, of a trip that looked like that, but I think the engines may have been reversed in terms of the color, down at Andover Junction. I've seen pictures of PAs well, there was on the LNHR, yeah, down in, in that 1964 area. 1964 trip that ran up the Susquehanna to Sparta, and then down the LNH to Andover, and then I believe then it went down the uh, Sussex branch. Yeah. That ran with PAs. But yeah, this that's what I'm thinking of. This is a different trip. Yeah. So when, when they came through Waldwick, the uh, gray... Yeah, was on the front. Yeah, that's because that I don't recall the order of the engines that were in the picture I had, with the Erie paint scheme being the one I remember at, at Andover. So maybe it is a different trip. Okay, um, one other comment that is not in the chat from um, uh, the, the Great Court area, though. Um, while we were while you were presenting, Doug, I was going through my. Um, let, me, let me turn my camera on. I'm sorry. There you go. Um, I don't know. Can you see? I'm looking at my art, my Bill Shepard. Uh, oh, track his diagram track drive. Track, track right. drive. And the, uh, that third track there, Greyport, that was the lead for the Newburgh branch. Mm. The tail of that third track at the East End, he has labeled as Camp LaGuardia. That's what that was? Well, I, I mean, that could be the name of a consignee. Well, Camp right. LaGuardia was a camp. They actually, the buildings themselves showed up in some of the photographs. But but he has he just has that you know, sort of pointing at that track at the very east end. Maybe know, the those are supplies end. and stuff for Camp LaGuardia because that's the the infamous place where they brought up a lot of homeless people. Where there were actually, since it became the Heritage Trail, people came from that place to attack some people on the trail. Oh wow! But that uh, and you know we didn't you know, a lot of issues about that. I don't know if it's closed now. I think it might be. But um, that was some type of uh, facility that could have used the rail service. So he's probably right. I never thought about it. They didn't have a direct track because of where they were located. So maybe somehow somebody yeah, came it was almost, Maybe it was like a team track for them or yeah, something. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering, yeah. yeah. Because the other leg of the Y probably would have been gone when steam is gone, the first leg. Yeah, so, that does not show in his book. Right? Yeah, yeah, that would have All been right, gone. Gordon, Gordon David's uh, Chester Tower was probably closed when the Erie installed. Automatic block signals, and uh, the tower call was moved to the station. Then, theory, uh, and the, the curve at Chester was definitely super elevated. Uh, and then Gordon was talking about the, the hotel in Goshen, Occidental, um, think, Occidental Hotel, right? Yeah, that's what's in the picture currently. Yeah, right. And um, yeah, the, the, that that H locomotive that you had there. Um, We'll have to help you identify what model it is. That was a six axle, probably a C628. Uh, okay. I had 430. Yeah. yeah John Barth. John Barth was on the 1961 trip. Do you want to comment on it, John? Unmute. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was Hoboken, the Erie Main Line. Uh, through Passaic, okay? Uh, then we went on the Graham line to MQ Tower to Maybrook, 
then Maybrook uh, on the LNH to Port Morris, then the old main line. We had a photo stop at Manunka Chunk and to East Stroudsburg, then came back on the Blairstown cutoff. Uh, I got off at Patterson on the old on the Booten line and then returned to Hoboken. Just out of curiosity, how much did you pay for the ticket? Uh, $5.60. I had a feeling you were going to say that. <laughs> I, I had to know because that's a trip. What would I pay for today if I could do it? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Five dollars. And, uh, and thank you, John. That was That's fascinating. Uh, yeah. Finally, Gordon confirms that all of the DH, DNH 600 series locomotives were C628s. C628s? Yes. So that was a 628? Yep. Okay. And that's I don't it. Know why I said two. All right. That's it with the comments. So, uh, how are I'm we doing for time? Part two. It is just about nine o'clock. Okay. So we're on schedule. All right. Let's see what we got. There aren't a lot of pictures of steam, at least not that I've found available, but I did manage to come up with this one. And this has got to be the late 40s or 50s because you just wouldn't see a Berkshire that often coming through town. Although there is a color image, if I recall, in one of the color books of a westbound Berkshire and that train 83 picture I showed you before, but not what you think normal power, but here it is. So it's probably on one of the, you know, train 83 pickups. This most likely is the pickup because it's daytime. And that's right on West Main Street. I do have another one of these that I recently found. Here's some RS3s with a commuter train. I love this picture because you can look right up West Main Street and you got the hotel. Circa 1960. Here's train 22 coming through town. Second view, you can see both engines. Now here's the map I had promised you. I had to blow it up because it's, uh, and this I think might actually be off a branch map and not the uh, Goshen map because of how it's orientated. Um, Goshen Depot's here. Our tower, GP Tower, is here. The Montgomery branch begins down here and comes all the way up behind the station into what is a secondary yard or between Church and uh, Erie Street, it actually has one track that goes all the way over the Scotchtown Turnpike. You got a turntable, and I believe the freight house is right here. So there's about a two or three track yard in here. The third track, which shows up in subsequent pictures, that's to the right of the eastbound main, actually goes through the platform by the station, as you'll see. So it was actually into the platform. They had something like this to serve a customer like that in Milltown. The cattle pen here, all this eventually would change. The Pine Island branch is out of sight to the right, but these are the beginning crossovers. So you cross over from westbound to eastbound Maine, and from here over is getting on to the beginning of the Pine Island branch. Now, this is a one of a kind shot in Ray's collection, but this is dual gauge, 1880. Where he got it from, I have no idea. Uh, the Montgomery branch would be off to the side, but there she is. So I assume it's around 1880, you're guessing, because it's around the time I think it was changed. Uh, it's a one-of-a-kind shot and raised collection of all. I didn't expect to find this. So maybe he took it out of a book. I know in the when I first got involved in the rail community in the 80s, guys were still taking their cameras and taking pictures of postcards or or out of an old book or something to make a slide to do a presentation. Um, today, we just flop it on a scanner. Uh, so maybe that's where it came from. I don't know, but it is Goshen. Now, this was also in Ray's collection, and this is pretty interesting because this 440 is typical branch line power in the early years for all the branches in the middle, uh, in the Orange County area, probably on a lot of branches. But this is on the uh, Montgomery branch. And this was an engine that would go up to Montgomery and back. And um, and also, I may have also done some of the work on the Pine Island branch, I suppose it's possible given the service involved. But that's uh, quite, a, quite a beautiful engine. 
This is one of the other steam shots I managed to acquire. Now she's he, he's doing some switching here, thirty three seventy four. So I got one box car, and he's right by the station. And this signal, I believe, is still there today. It's one of the few remaining pieces of the railroad. Uh, and this is July 6, 1950. So West Main Street is out of sight, just out of sight to the right. And um, I was thrilled to find this. Because it's just hard to find steam. It's just hard to find steam. Now, John Stellwagen didn't get any steam because he moved to the area in 53 or 54. And by then, steam is gone. So um, unfortunately, John was, was late comer to the area. Ray Brown got a lot of steam, but usually Middletown or West because of where he was located. This is John looking from the depot back at the crossing. You can barely see the switch that I was talking about up in this area, but it'll show up clear. He caught uh, train one coming in under the eve of the station. Christmas Day, 1960. Then a PA in July of 1960. This is the beginning of that track that goes through the platform here. And this is the beginning of the tracks that go into the freight house. I just added this an hour before we got online because I wanted to do it. I just got, a, I found them in, in John's collection. There was three or four images, but these two of the better ones. This PA is coming in with train one right on pretty much West Main Street or Main Street Crossing, as it was called at the time. And she's slowing down and pulling right into the station. And he's standing right next to the, right next to the building here. Now, John's down the beginning of the yard. You see the platform coming out here. This is the track that would go through the platform up in this area, which we'll see. And these are the two tracks that were around the freight house. There's like a two or three track yard here. But the local, the Pine Island train would get on this uh, a lot uh, after they do switching in here and back down. And have to back down the Pine, Bush, uh, Pine Island branch because there are no turning places on the whole branch except for one runaround that shows up in Florida, and that was with the creamery. So as everything was back then, then they would bring her back into town. There was a turntable in the early years in Pine Island in steam days. And here's some better shots of our Goshen Depot. It's not a bad looking building. I'd always, when I looked at this with the bay window, um, something about this structure, and correct me if I'm wrong, it always reminds me of the positive. There's something about it, the structure, the length, the brick. I don't know. I think a deposit. And I used to go by there and stop and look at deposit when I was going to college, too. So that's probably part of it. Here's a couple of you. You can see a lot of cars in the yard here. Now, note the front of the building because this is going to change with the one window. It's not this way today. There's actually, they've enlarged it, doubled the size of it, in fact. Notice in 74 what's there, and that's what's there today. So they even changed this, put in a bigger window. This is the back side. This is the Montgomery branch, the far track. And there are two side tracks in here that served and crossed on a diamond, one for a lumber yard, one for a coal dealer. So you actually had a diamond just off the Montgomery branch. And this is during the 1960s. This is the tracks that's going to go through the platform, as we'll say. Uh, if you're ever in that area, this shot you could easily take because the church deep tower dominates the whole part of town. In fact, with a few changes to the highway, you can see this on 17, right in the center of town. It's the highest point in the city, in the city a village. This is 76, so Conrail's in play in the Erie. Lackawanna's gone. They still have the platform that they would add back in the 40s or 50s. Similar one in Middletown they would add for the eastbound passengers to, to wait out of the rain and the snow. Here's the track I mentioned. Comes off the eastbound main, goes right through the platform to service that part of the yard. Waiting room door for access to the ticket office taken May 1966. Why do I have that there? Because, and I didn't get a chance to scan it, there's a lot more. 
of that. John got in the station. It does not look like this today. If you go in there today, you're in there to ask for something because it's the police station. So you can get a tour of it if you break the law, but it's not going to look like this. But John got some decent shots inside with the potbelly stove. That's the ticket agent's office there. Look, I have to explain this to my former students. What is that? Is it a is it a porta potty? No, it's called a phone booth. I even remember phone booths in the restaurants when I lived in the city. Quite common. We could use them today, so everybody's not talking on their phone while you're having dinner. You know, I mean, it drives me crazy. And a look inside the ticket booth. Again, there's a lot more of these. I just haven't gotten a chance to scan those uh, negatives. And there's some duplication, but it's it's a real treat to look inside the depot of any depot, let alone one that's been you know changed so much on the inside. At least the building's still there. These I see we have a little problem with covering it up. These are Marv Cohen's. The lower image is one that you've probably seen published, but he also took this one here on the side. You notice the woman here with the cane. And this is almost on the track that leads into this portion of the yard. Look at where she's walking right through the platform. It's a beautiful picture. I'll tell you, PA looks gorgeous in the scheme. I know there are other paint schemes, Santa Fe and whatever, but something about the the, the eerie black and yellow on this really grabs me. I like the two-tone green, but PAs, it really accentuates them with the wings on it. Boy, it's gorgeous. The L and E isn't bad either because we're going to see them in a few minutes. Here's another one coming in. There's another train's leaving. Nice picture during the late 50s. Oops, one too many. This is the shot I was referring to because um, this came from Railroad Avenue Enterprises. Um, I think Hellwagon might have taken this because these were purchased negatives according to uh, uh, Bob's uh, notes on the back. And I know he sold a lot of stuff to Bob. But there's the switch, and you can clearly see the whole thing going right through the platform to get to the tracks and river. And that's important because there's a couple of shots that Marv got, and the train is sitting like right here before it goes through the platform. It's a local. I think it's when the Erie Limit is coming through 10. This is the 1404, so it's a uh, specifically for passenger service. And then John at 61 got a couple of shots at the back end of the train. These buildings are still there, but this is, you're driving on it. It's a parking lot now. That building still exists. That's the post office. Passenger exit a westbound commuter train. Why this particular picture? That's John Stellwagen's mother. That's how I remember it. And he got pictures of mom coming up to visit him from Jersey because he was originally from uh, northern Jersey. And he came up for Christmas time, and I think that's some of his gifts. Now, somehow he got up in the building right above the platform. You can see the walkway between the platforms. And he got train number one coming into town at speed. I wish it was a little sharper, not blurred, but I'd rather have it than not. That's a nice shot overall. These are Marv's. She's coming in now. Notice the track through the platform because Marv would turn around and take that. And look what's sitting here. It's the 1203 and the 1216 probably on the pickup. And as I think I point out in a subsequent shot, got a number of boxcars, but quite a few gondolas back here as she pulls in the Erie, uh, pulls into the station. So it's quite a nice little composition that Marv captured here. He's got some other interesting shots here. A couple I didn't manage to get in the program, unfortunately, but I did get a couple of real uh, nice ones that he got color-wise. Then he panned it a little bit. He got on the back of the passenger platform, shot both engines, which is how I know what the other number was. And then here, because of how he looked, it was much more evident to me that you could see there's at least a half a dozen gondolas on the back of this. So she could be switching in this portion of the yard. Um, it's in the 50s. 
I don't think the gondolas are going to the Pine Island branch, uh, but there's some switching going on here with whatever this gun system, the train is on that side. Now there was a couple of tracks on the other side of GP Tower, which I think was used also for uh, the Montgomery branch and also for, for the foundry, which we'll see in a few other images. It's quite a complex yard. There's that area again, looking at the station. Here's your Montgomery branch, post office, church building, West Main Street, eastbound passenger. This is actually quite relative, 1964. I loved it because, look, the engines are switching back here by the freight house, shuffling some cars. It looks like maybe a Jeep 35 or a GP7. I can't really tell. Uh, but the caboose is sitting right here on the eastbound main all by itself. Now, the last day of the Goshen Station, his last day was December 6th, 1966. And from that point, Middletown Station with its three employees would handle Goshen business. And this is a nice little article about him. From what it said, he was a pretty nice gentleman, Mr. Gerard. Gerard. Love his hat. I could use one today, that's for sure. Now, I did manage to find some decent color shots with the tracks, uh, which wasn't easy, but I found a few. So this is May of 76, so EL is gone. It's the beginning of Conrail. This is 74. Now, by this point in time, the Pine Island branch is long gone, and the Montgomery branch might also be gone because I think there was a wreck in the late 60s that took the diamond out up at MQ Tower. But there was still some local switching to be done, but nuts through traffic. But still had a fair number of customers. The local would still come down and switch this from Middletown. This is, I think, from Railroad and Enterprises. I don't know why it's still in here. I guess I just forgot to hide it. Oop. A couple of color shots. Commuter trains coming into town. And here's Middletown Drill heading back to Middletown. Should be GP7, but I'll fix that. So this is kind of late. And he did manage to get a couple of shots of the U-34Cs. This is probably the best one that he had. So I made sure I put it in there because it's, you know, not, not that dissimilar. And this is most likely which way? Eastbound train, right? Because it's push-pull. Every time I looked at it, I always went, until I realized that, I was like, wait, wait a minute. It's not going east. That's a sad one. October of 1983, less than two years before everything's going to be ripped out. That shot has always bothered me, but not as much as that one. John took this in 1985. That's really desolate. Now, it has made a comeback. It's all paved. They fixed this up. The station's painted. It's the police station. Uh, the, sig the tower station, uh, the, the signal's still there. But it's sad when you're looking at all the other images. It really is. And that's what the Goshen Police Station looked when I last went down there and photographed it years ago. And, um, you know, it's, you know, you can see all the cars parked. It's a nice community. You can park here, walk up and down and see all the shops and stuff. Still avail yourself. Now, today, if you park here and you had a bike, you can bike south to Chester or go as far as you want. But you can also go west because the trail is open to Six and a Half Station Road, soon to be opened into Middletown. So you can avail yourself of the shops and et cetera and, uh, you know, go one direction or the other. I, that's what I used to like to do when I was able to bike. Hopefully, I will be again soon backside of the depot. And this is the main, where the main, main line would have been. Back to the days of trains and tracks. The Middletown drill, switching cars, having crossed the platform. We do have a fair amount of Middletown drill in Goshen. Here's a view into the yard with the freight house. So you can see eastbound, westbound, Montgomery branch, and the four so tracks that are here with the freight house. That's the, the Goshen foundry in the background. 
which had its own track to service it. Shabby looking shot of, of the freight house in 74. That's Blue Seal uh, feeds in the background, which was a big customer in later years. Now, this is an interesting picture, and it's not for what's in the picture. John is on the caboose backing down to go to Pine Island. He is actually riding the Pine Island local. And into town comes what looks like the Erie Limited. There's the foundry. These are the cars on what I mentioned to you was a two-track yard that was on the other side of GP Tower. And you can see the platform here next to the station, the tracks that extend. And down here is the Pine Island branch in this clearing. And here's the proof. Train gets closer. He's on the back end of the caboose looking at the train coming in. Northampton and Bath boxcar here. I always love that railroad. And as the train passes, he's still proceeding through the yard. It's at the very end, the Pine Island branch. It's like 60, 61. Now, this is the other map that has portions of Goshen on it. You can clearly see the turntables, about 70 feet when they had it, <coughs> the ice house. But more importantly, the crossovers for the branch work with the Lehigh New England coming through town. This bridge, I've got a picture, it still exists today. I managed to get pictures of the crossing of what was West Main Street crossing at one point. It's a dead end street at this point in time. And the rails are still on the road, they just paved over. Uh, the crossover to get you to actually the Pine Island branch proper. There was an ice house here, of course. Uh, GP Tower and the crossovers right in front. Now when this gets removed, these aren't changing until 19, Let's see, 61 maybe, they would probably need to use the interlocking because at that point the Pine Island branch goes, the Lehigh New England is gone, and the Pine Island branch doesn't last very long. So nobody's going to be crossing both mains. But while the Lehigh New England's in here, every time they came through and they got permission, which I believe they waited right in this area. So we've got an image of a train sitting there. They had to foul all these switches to get to the Montgomery branch. That means effectively nobody is going east-west on the main line. Nobody. And they couldn't have switched here because switching this portion of the yard behind this would be problematic because of where they had to go. So I think from what I see in later pictures, they did their drop-offs and pickups for the Erie's interchange on the Montgomery branch yard that we saw earlier, which was just above the station. And later pictures show that. And here's the foundry track, of course, being up in this area here. Now, I had to show this. This came from the Barringer Collection. And the reason I had to show it is because it captures all this. The foundry track, the two-track yard that's this side of GP Tower, one of the crossovers to go to West Bat. This is the third track here, but this is actually the beginning of the Montgomery branch here. The yard area by the freight house, the coal elevator we mentioned that was off on the sidetrack, which we'll see when we flip up the Montgomery branch. The station is just out of view out here. These are the tracks on the other side of the freight house, and that's the Pine Island branch going out of town. It's a great, great image. This is one, oh, went too fast. This is one of the other images I managed to get. Uh, I know Dennis Yakacek said he'd seen it before. I hadn't. I managed, when I was able to acquire it, I was happy because it's obviously GP Tower. You can see the crossovers here from the westbound to eastbound Main, which means behind the photographer is the crossover from the eastbound Main to the Pine Island branch, which begins behind the photographer. This train is on the curve going into the station, and the freight house is out of sight to the right. Notice the milk cars on this one. Most likely train nine, I believe it was. Lots of milk. Now, I heard a story about GP Tower. I don't know how true it is, but the story goes that there was a work order to fix and repair the building, and after it was all repaired, shortly thereafter, they tore it down. So it was a work order to repair it, and then after they did all the repairs, the carpenters, whatever, the tower came down. I don't know when the tower came down, but 
around 1949, on the revision records for the Goshen map that I managed to acquire, it says that the controls for these switches were now moved to the station. Well, if they're moved to the station around 49, that means GP Tower is no longer in service. And there was a movie that, um, let me think if I can think of the gentleman, he's from the Jersey Central Society, showed of a Lehigh, New England cab ride. And as the, cab, as the train gets into Goshen, there's a Berkshire that has its train split. Uh, and you see the Berkshire with a couple of cars behind it, basically so that the uh, Lehigh, New England cut through the yard. And as the train passes through the yard, this tower is there. Well, the Lehigh, New England got their FAs in 1948. So if that note is right and it's around 49, perhaps... It's around the same time periods. Erie Steam is still around at the time. And the tower might not have gone down directly after the powers were transferred for controls to switch the station. I don't think they tore it down the exact same day. There's nothing on the revision records that says when they took that down. But there is about, you know, being able to control the switches electronically into the station. So that's the telltale sign of that. Now, Stellwagen got in the yard, and this is a similar place, caught the Erie Limited coming out and going away, and there's that area track and that clearing that's the Pine Island branch here. I wish these negatives were better. I did everything I could, but they're slightly bowed and until I get some actual glass to put them between and lay them flat on the platen, it's as good as I can get them with what I have. But it does show that pretty well. See the freight house here. It's July of 1960, so it's right at the end of Erie, beginning of Erie, Lackawanna. This is a gem. Note where that train is compared to this one, okay, and where we were earlier. Note where the tower was supposed to be, what's there, okay? Here's the foundry. Why? This is obviously in merger days based on the consist, so uh, there was no date on the slide, so I'm assuming this is very early 1960s. Uh, before all the traffic went over to the Lackawanna. Uh, there's a Lehigh New England shot that puts the train right here. And here it is. There's the foundry. This is Mr. Stellwagen. And there's the L&E going out of town. Again, not the best negative, but listen, you can't reshoot it. I think this is five units. Because an A, B, and A... I think it's a B, and I think I got another A back here. So they would run these things as they call them elephant style, cutting through the yard. Now, one of the reasons there's a lot more pictures on the Montgomery branch and the Pine Island branch of the Lehigh, New England is twofold. How many photographers were around to take the pictures in the early days when there was that many locals on the two subsequent Erie branches? Not many. Branch line service changed in the 40s to three times a week. No passenger service after the mid uh, 1930s, early 30s on most on both lines, I believe. Milk traffic was pretty much gone to trucks. But the Lehigh, New England, until the late 40s, is running three trains a day. So when the photographers started going around capturing action, which train could they capture? The Lehigh, New England. Now, in the later years, the Lehigh, New England is running three trains a week. But that's still two more trains than the locals, which uh, actually it's, it's about equal. The local would come down here three times a week. But, you know, it was available. So that's what they managed to capture. And not a lot of shots of the local, which is unfor unfortunate. There's that picture I was alluding to uh, right on the crossing. And that's how I knew where it was because there's the foundry. And that's a tender, it looks like, of an Erie steam locomotive with the diamond on it. Now, that's roughly what this opening looks like relative to today. The trail is open here. There's what's left of the signal. And this is the Pine Island branch coming out. You'd never know it. You never would believe it. That's that same area. Take a good look. There's the signal. See the Lehigh New England just sitting there patiently? She's probably waiting so she has clearance to finally come through town. This is the eastbound and westbound mains going out and the third track that started a little bit outside of town that was along the montgomery branch that had the two-track yard 
and the lead to the foundry. These are the tracks that run behind the freight house, and this is the lead for the Pine Island branch, which would also have off of it the additional few yard tracks that were by the freight house. So here's John backing down. You're right on the switch. See that switch? Here's John. Well, let's go back. He's right on the switch. That would have been the West Main Street crossing in the early years. It's been changed, but that's where he is on the caboose in the Pine Island local. And they backed all the way down to Pine Island, the whole way, with an SW9. And notice our brakeman throwing the switch. Now, this bridge is still there. It's been paved over. It's used as a driveway. But this was that bridge I alluded to looking at the map. It's still there. Notice it's got the milepost right on the bridge, 59.15. And that is right back here. So they changed it with the road a little bit. But there are the rails back in the early 2000s of the Pine Island branch coming out of town. And this is the West Main Street heading in towards the station back here. This has changed a lot. There's new buildings and new high-rise high apartments here, three or four stories or so. But this was, you know, free to see. So I went back home, drove 15 miles home, grabbed my camera, ran down here and got these pictures because I didn't know when they were going to pave over it. And there's a view on the Goshen Yard side looking up. Now, if you ever come over here, the ground rises right next to the road that takes you up to the other portion of Goshen where the... Uh, some services and stores, etc. Right down here on this supposed ramp is the Pine Island branch, which is around these houses. This used to be the West Main Street Road, which went through, but once the uh, 17 was put in, it cut it and made it a dead end, and they changed and realigned it. This bridge under 17 is what was built over the Pine Island branch. Still there, they didn't fill it in. Here's the proof. Lehigh New England coming through. And she's substantially higher. She goes up quite a grade, much higher than the main line in that short distance to get up over a few hills uh, than the main liners. So that's under 17. John is here inside the caboose looking out under that overpass on the local. And you notice it's curving the track slightly here. That's because it's curving as the Lehigh New England goes under what's now 17M. Now, this is all cleared out. There's some construction going on here now, and um, you'd never know it. And you can't even see this. This has all been filled in. So after the Pine Island, they filled that sucker in, got rid of that bridge in a hurry. Heartbeat. But here's the l &E with three units and ABA. That's Route 17 here in the background. Not sure if these this couple of these pictures got in Peter Brill's Lehigh New England book. When he did his Lehigh New England book, he didn't have a scanner. So from up in New England, Peter and I exchanged God knows how many scans of what I had to help him do his Lehigh New England books. All the material I gathered for it kind of worked. Partners, he's such a prolific writer. I hope I could write half the books he's done. I think he's written twenty six. He's pumping out books so fast it's an assembly line. He's amazing. Good friend. This is a little further west since the last shot on the Pine Island branch. This, I think, is the other crossing of what would have been West Main Street. And you got one of the big 280s coming. And that bridge, I believe, is 17M. So that's as far as I'm going to go. You're about a mile and a half out from the Goshen Station pro proper, just outside on the Pine Island branch. And I have a whole program on the Pine Island branch. It's uh, but it, you, you, we couldn't do it tonight. But I wanted to show you, give a little flavor, because this is the nexus for those two branches. And more importantly, this through traffic that's going to bisect the east and westbound mains during the years of the Lehigh New England and her predecessors. Or excuse me, her, not predecessors, her, uh, I lost the word. The, the roads before, that's what I meant. It's been a long day, my dog in Oswald. Now, I did manage to find this shot, and this is pretty early. I, I put on 1920s because I didn't have a chance to look it up. Notice, no fried egg, 307. So it's one of their big 280s. The fried egg is not on the tender yet. This is on the Montgomery branch 
because the Montgomery branch would start to be lower when it first was going around the curve. It tended to be lower until it got close to the station. This is the westbound and eastbound mains in Goshen. It looks like he's switching here, too. Now, here you are with diesel days, and you can see on the Montgomery branch, there's the foundry. She's definitely a little lower grade uh, than the main line. And these engines, by the way, they look ratty. The story on this is this. Those engines were originally painted white, and the black went over the white. So they kept washing their engines, and what happened? The black paint came off. Well, she looked ratty as heck near the end of the life of the railroad. Was of course they were washing it. wasn't because you know anything else, but the the engines were actually white, and then they striped it out, put the black over it. So uh, because I know they can look, some of them look awful ratty near the end of the Lehigh New England. That one looks like it's one of the ones that got repainted, as you can tell. The seven hundred nine got the ivory husk, so this one was repainted as opposed to those. I don't know what this is, but I put it in here because. This is that coal dealer, got a coal car here and all the different grades of anthracite for heating alongside here. It's one of the better shots I had of that. And this is the Montgomery branch. This is the station platform for Goshen. This is that track that crossed through the platform. And these are the switches that are heading down to the uh, freight house. Better view, one of the other one. I think this is the better one than the last one, but I couldn't work out. This was that elevated coal bunker we looked at from the back. The other part of the yard, and you can see all the coal that was in here. And this track crossed the other track for the lumber yard, which is starting here on a diamond, which will show up in a couple other images. Right here. This goes into the lumber yard. This off the Grand Street Canal Street crossing goes into the coal pockets and the coal. That's still a library, still there today. Today, if you looked here, the firehouse is right here, so you can't even look through it. The, yard, the tracks would have gone through the firehouse. The yard for the Montgomery branch actually begins right here, Church, Church Street Crossing. Now, here's the Middletown drill coming up the Montgomery branch. You come down here Tuesday, Thursdays, Saturdays, or on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just come down to work Goshen, which is also possible. Cars by the freight house, the foundry, and it looks like a commuter train heading outside of town. It's taken from the Goshen platform. One two-car local for the Middletown drill looks like she's definitely going up or coming back from the Montgomery branch. Clear shot of the switch that went through the platform here. There's a nice view, two-car train on the Montgomery branch. There's your diamond for the coal bunker and the lumber yard that crossed. Blue seal cement, uh, blue seal cement, blue seal feeds, excuse me. This is 1960, so it's another year, a little over a year. Pine Island branch with the Leon and the Wingle will be gone. And then I don't know exactly how long the Erie ran it, but it couldn't have been very long, according to the people I know up here who worked for Erie. Like, I wonder, it seems like it just went right away. Um, Here's another view. You can see the general building with the diamond coming in. It's a long curve crossing to go into that coal bunker. Now, this is interesting. This is on the Montgomery branch. Marv Cohen took these pictures. Now, there's a several other pictures. I see I got a typo up there. Um, what's interesting is it's not two, it's not three, it's four GP7s. So here's the first shot. And these are in order that they were taken. Here's the second shot with the caboose. And here's the third shot. What looks like a train here. So I don't know what's going on except the fact that if it's down here, something must have happened. Maybe something at the ground. I don't know. There's another sequence of shots, perhaps the same December day, with a caboose. Uh, this shot has been published, a C C24, C25, if you get which, numbers 2411, I do remember that, so you guys remember your numbers, know which kind of engine it is. And then following a 2B and then an A unit, all FAs, with a caboose in front of the cab unit. And that was down here. 
So something must have happened to have this kind of action taking place. And it looks like it's in the very early 60s. So it's possible the Pond Island branch is still around. There's no real data. No, I stand corrected. The date on it, I think I said it was 63, right? Pond Island branch is gone. I stand corrected. Like I said, it's been a long day. Uh, but interesting to see this kind of activity down here, two cabooses. The other train has a caboose on one side of the C-424, one on the FAs, and that's all there is. And I don't know what's going on, but it looks like it's all this December 63. So I'm betting he shot this the same day. The great shots. I just don't know what's going on here. Now, John, and it's not unusual, got this shot in 1960s, and there's three Jeeps going up the Montgomery branch. So something went on, and they're not down here by accident, and this is not the local, uh, and they're probably going to Maybrook. What else would they be doing? But I've also heard that there are hot cars, and there's some moves from up MQ coming down, and F units to be down here. Sure enough, there's a shot Gene Calora took. Many of you have probably seen it right by MQ Tower with the high-speed rail fork and the number. Everything looks like it's composed. John's got pictures of F units here on the uh, Canal Street in Goshen, uh, switching the Montgomery Street Yard. These I was very fortunate to come up with. Again, similar kind of move, a couple of GP7s. Doesn't look like a local to me. And going away. Lehigh New England car here. And you can see the lumber yard. Same time period, Marv caught these F units with a caboose in the yard, all on the Montgomery branch. It's all on the Montgomery branch. Here's another J. I don't think John had a date on this or I was remiss in getting it. These are F units coming through. So not uncommon as much as we might think it was not common. There's your coal dealer. F units coming through town. F units going uptown, doing Erie Lackawanna. Notice the logo on the front of the locomotive. Another color shot, ABBA with a caboose, 1960. Now, here's some Lehigh, New England, which obviously is, you know, they're still in business. So it's 60 or 61 or earlier. This is October of 60. And this train, most likely, that you can't see down where GP Tower used to be, where the control, uh, I call it the control box for lack of remembering at the moment, but for the interlocking, probably cut all the tracks off to the Pine Island branch because they never came up with anything less than 50, 60 cars. And um, there's quite a few that you see, but there's a lot that you're not seeing. Now, here they're running light, so either their train is behind me or they're switching the yard up here, which is possible. Here they're coming through town, going up. And notice he's getting in orders with this eastbound train. Well, quite the place to be. And notice he's right in Edmond for the two sidings. It's one of a heck of a place to be when the Lehigh New England was running through town. I would have liked to have seen it in the 30s when all the locals are running and they're running their steam through here. It's been a wonderful place to be if you could had the cameras to take the pictures that we had today. Whoops, I'll go too fast. Here's another Lehigh New England train, May of 61. So this is the year they're going to go out. And one thing great about this color shot that I've managed to acquire it's May 20th, 1959. You can at least look down and see the train is still going all the way down the foundry. So it's most likely fouled the east and westbound mains and on its way still onto the Pine Island branch. They don't come up with short trains. At this point in time, they're running three trains a day, uh, three trains a week roughly. So they're usually pretty long trains. Freight house is invisible here too, if you didn't notice it. Right, I can't see my cursor. Here's the L&E coming with a westbound. It's got some coal cars here. Getting orders. And again, this is pretty sharp curve. This is going in the yard 
would be back here. Hind end getting orders from the agent, August 9th, 1960. These are Stell wagons, most of these black and whites. Here's another eastbound. And there's Mr. Gerard, this is probably Mr. Gerard. There, he doesn't have his hat on, but I recognize him with his glasses. Occasionally we get lucky and get a little color. Is it a westbound going to Pernalgel? I think the next shot's a cool one. Yeah. The hind end, I love this shot. And he's waiting to get his order. I think the agent is like behind the pole here. There's one other one. I hope I got it in the program. No, nope, I guess I forgot to. This is why it's called Canal Street. There's a little creek here. This bridge is where the branch is. That's the firehouse. So if you follow the straight and you're going right through the building. There's the bridge. Notice no firehouse. This is the beginning of the yard on the Montgomery Bridge. There's that bridge I was referring to and an eastbound train to Maybrook. This is during the scrapping, I believe. That's why that crane is there. But since we're on that end of the branch, I threw it in. He's right almost on the bridge. He's got a gondola. I do have some pictures of them scrapping this line. I got them from good friend Bob Earl, but it's up at the 207 crossing, and I didn't get to put it in the program. So here's a better view of what that area is. Here's the Montgomery branch coming in. It was a customer in this area at one point. Church Street, which is what we were looking at. And then there's a three, two-track yard. This is Erie Street. This track runs between the two streets. The other long run around runs past Erie Street and then is stub-ended further out to its Scotchdown Turnpike. But this area here would be the so-called branch yard, as I'm calling it. And look who's there, switching cars. Erie F units. Switching cars in the yard. And notice the bridge she's on. Here's another view. These are Stell wagons. You can actually see a car or two in the yard here. This is parking for the post office. So you're right next to Ron Post Office property. And you got a close-up shot of it. So maybe it wasn't as unusual as... At least I was led to believe more and more you research and you're looking for photographs and you find stuff. And more and more the, the thing that you said didn't happen often showing up at different times. That's what sold me on the Lehigh New England switching this yard. What else are they doing? They're switching cars. And it would make sense that they would probably come up here since there's minimum traffic in those days, drop off cars for the Erie, but on the way out of town, pick up what was for them, why would they take it to Maybrook? So they'd make a pickup. Now, when they ran three trains a day, one train on the Lehigh New England was designated to be like a local and would pick up at all the other locations. The other two would pick through trains. At this point, it's three trains a week. So every train would probably stop if there was something there because they weren't running every day. But that's what sold me that, you know, at least at some point in time, they're using this yard for interchange. Now these are Marv Cohen's almost at the end of that first track. There's a whistle post here. Uh, Erie Street is out of sight to the right and you've got the 707, 751 and 704 coming into town. And on the other side of that is that other track. And Marv panned the camera Caught the two engines coming by, which was great because that gave me the number off the B unit. Um, and then he went back to that similar shot with the buildings and three straight Lehigh New England cars. It's the Lehigh New England train, right? But I like the fact that they were all together. So I said, let me put it in the program. I think it looked pretty cool. The only thing would have been better if this was in color, but still a great shot. And it's all gone today. It's a parking lot, I think, now. Now, this is that track that I said, this is Scotchtown Avenue. 
this ended as a double-ended siding pa well past the engine. But this came up as stub-ended track, maybe for switching. I don't know. They only recently ripped the rails out because this is now a road to go into a new development today. But there's the Lehigh New England coming up on the main track of the Montgomery branch, heading out of Goshen, going up to Maybrook. This is the 207 crossing at the very edge of the village on the north side of town. Right, and this would be going north towards Campbell Hall. Here's the Montgomery branch. To my surprise, I went there recently, couldn't get it in the program and everything going on. I did take some digital pictures recently in here. This right away here is very visible, but you can't see it when the foliage is around. It's obscured. Foliage dropped. I got in there. You can totally see the right away coming back here. It's untouched. This side, it's become a driveway, and there's a gate here. This shot, I always thought, was an eastbound. I'm not so sure anymore because of the way this hill is situated. I, I now think it's a westbound because there's the crossing gates for 207, and that's the angle that it would be. So I was thinking it was an eastbound, and then when I looked at it, and the pole line is in the wrong place. If it was, this is probably a westbound. And that's on 207. It's a Bob Collins shot. Now, Ray Brown got up in here, and he actually just shot the crossing. In fact, thankfully, Ray went up and shot all the major crossings on the Montgomery branch before it got ripped out. Without, we wouldn't have it. And you're looking towards Maybrook here. This is a driveway today. It's gated. This is 207 going up to Campbell Hall. And you can see how clear the right-of-way is up here. Stellwick and got that. So there's the yellow ink about the cross going to Maybrook, 709. That's one of the ones that had the, the lines painted through. We called them elephant tusks, December 3rd, 1960. But then I found this one, westbound, right on 207. The culvert's still there, heading back. Soon it'll be in the village and then cross over the Pine Island branch, head out to Penn Archer, Pennsylvania. You'd never recognize this today. This area is, but, it, but there's so many trees here. You, you know, stopping the car, I couldn't stop it here. I pulled into the new development that's been put in and walked in here. And even with that, it was a little precarious with the way people drive today. Now, that's about it on the two branches. This is a little bit out of town at the end of our program. This is the third track coming into town. You see how it's lower. That's part of the reason why when the LNE finally gets over there, it's a little bit lower when it crosses over. But this is much lower here. The trolley that used to run from Middletown to uh, Goshen used to run in this area. This is the bridge that's still there today. The trail goes under of Route 17, third track, westbound main, eastbound main. And this is out towards 17, uh, six and a half station road here. This is looking back into Goshen from the other side of the bridge. Now, this bridge, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, rebuilt. So it doesn't even look like that anymore. Stellagen was out there, and just as the curve going out to Six and a Half Station Road, he caught this PA on June 18, 1961. And that's the third track. You notice it's a little recessed, a little lower for switching that part of the yard where the Montgomery branch and everything is. This hill in the background, that's Orange County Jail today. And now it's very evident. That was a farming area, no longer. This is Ray Brown standing on what I believe is Route 17, not less traffic in those days. And he caught an eerie commuter train coming into town. Stellwagen walked a little further out. You're still in Goshen. I got out there with a digital camera to show you the right of way through the wetlands, which now you can walk on or ride your bike. And there was a tower out here called XA Tower. Not a great shot, but it's one I got from Dennis Yakachek. And this is where Six and a Half Station Road is. And you can see it goes out to three tracks here. I added a steam shot and I didn't get it in here. But one of the reasons I did put it in is there's that bypass I talked to you about earlier. Would have cut all that off, gone to the other side of town. You'd never have to go into that U-shaped portion of Goshen Yard had they built it. This is Stellwagen out in that area with the same train coming by and then passing out, heading out towards Middletown and New, actually New Hampton and then Middletown. 
There may be one more shot. Yeah, this might be the last shot. June 10th, 61, coming around the curve. This is the wetland, and then she's going to reverse curve, go into Goshen. So that might that might be it. Let's see. Yep. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed creating it. It was a lot of work because it needed to be re revamped after many years of never been shown. Um, that's my email address, which I think comes up on another slide. If you want to get in touch with me, and yes, the address is the Middletown Drill. That's one of the reasons I have that email address, because I love that train and that job. It went everywhere. And I happen to have something, which I, I don't think I can pull it up, but I have the number plate <laughs> of the 1675, which is a 280, which was known to be in Middletown. And when Ray Brown had a uh, sister had an auction and they had all these number plates and there was a bunch of Berkshires and Pacifics and everything else. I went for the 280 because I knew that that train ran every, that engine ran everywhere down here. So I went to Montgomery, went everywhere and I had to have it. And I managed to acquire it. I should have took a picture and put in the program, but that's my love of that job that went eventually everywhere to all the branches. There's another part, which we're not doing for quite some time. I've given it to the OMW Society. The main line, New Hampton, the Howells. Uh, some of the guys are present tonight have seen it. Um, that's what precipitated this, because Jeff Gabriel saw the first part and asked me this. And I said, well, I'm showing this for the OMW. Let me revamp the other one. I don't have the one done from Howells Junction to Port Jervis. I haven't shown that since the Erie Convention in Port Jervis, and God knows when that was. Um, so that totally has to be revamped there's lots of material and i know the images are old but if you're curious to give a plug to the historical society that i created the middletown and new jersey railway society who did do a diagram book which the lhs sells and uh, some of our books we do we have the unionville flyer that comes out quarterly and the reason i bring it up is that's the cover of not this month's but the previous one came out taken from route 84 was a Hauser shot, and we started to do the program that would follow this one. Uh, it was a little bit more Eli Lackawanna, and it's nominal fee to join, and you get a digital copy of it, too, if you're so inclined. We do a lot of eerie stuff because it's a main connection for the railroad, and so much of it emanated from Middletown, and, of course, uh, you know, with, with yours truly being a part of it and, the, and a driver through it, I can't help but get eerie stuff in because anything came went through East Main Street right by the m &J. So, you know, maybe you don't like that. That's the address. And again, that's my email address. So I hope you enjoyed it. That's a picture, by the way, down here of New Hampton with the new station. Not much of a station. <laughs> but this building is there. So if you go down there, the trail goes through there. That's Mason's store. So you can't help but miss us. They make you slow down. Uh, but that's one of the pictures in the article and uh, in the program that, that follows. So someday down the road, we'll do that one for you. That'll be awesome, Doug. Um, what a great job. Thank you. It was very thorough, comprehensive, and entertaining. So on behalf of everybody on the call tonight and everybody who could join us, thank you so much for sharing. Yes, thank well, you thanks, for the thanks for the privilege of being able to share it. It's yeah, nice wow. to be, you know, this is not like teaching calculus to a bunch of kids who want to be on their cell phone. <laughs> 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 Which was a nightmare for most of the end of my career. What a nightmare, you know. Uh, this is an audience that wants to see and wants to share. And I wish you guys were my calculus students because I'm sure the grades would have been a lot better. We have a, quite a few questions in the chat if you want to um, take a quick look. Let's go ahead. Them. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Mr. Crone notes that the two PAs on the Fan Trip in 1961 were the only two PA2 PA model. PA2s. PA2s, right. Okay. Uh, I gotta write Steve this Cohen down. gives us a little history about Camp LaGuardia and its varying um, purposes over time. And it was finally closed in 2006. Uh, Gordon Davids talks about the number of cross arms on the telegraph poles and noting that many of the circuits were for Western Union, uh, which followed the main line, um, not the Graham line. Uh, the main line was there first. so. Uh, William Estella, great show. Thank you. Uh, Larry Kirstein, why was the route abandoned in favor of the route to the north, which appears uh, to be longer looking at the map? 
I, I, I think the reason for that is Conrail was given an option of which, um, which line they were going to get money from the state from. And with all the crossings and everything else that are involved in maintaining that, I think that's one of the reasons why it, it went, which defeats the point of passenger traffic, because when you think about it, it went through the areas where you'd get people on the trains, but you had no great crossings. And I think that's the scuttlebutt that I got at the m &J station as it came down to that. And that's why it got ripped out, because it's actually shorter. But remember, the main line, even by the time that happened, only goes to Howells because the rest of the main line has already gone up to Graham. That got pulled out in 53 to 54. So, you know, it's sad. Um, it's, uh, I wish it was still there. I think that's what I find interesting about it. There's something about you removing something or it disappears that it becomes a mystery and piques my attention <laughs> because now I have to find out what it was. The Graham line has never really interested me that much. Not that I haven't done photography on it. It's still there. <laughs> Not, it's not the same mystery. It's not as hard to find things. Fair and I point. think a lot of us are like that with the railroad stuff, you know. So, but I think that was the story. Conrad couldn't get the money for both, and that's the one they got rid of. I think I also heard at a previous ELHS uh, convention that um, uh, both Goshen and Middletown wanted the tracks out of the center of the town. Yeah, I think that's part of it, too. I think you're right there. And it was a bad, it was, it, it caused problems because a lot of small businesses got hurt, you know? Um, so, um, you know, it's just, you know, if you go in the Middletown yard now, there in the middle of the freight yard is a uh, skateboard park for guys to do all kinds of tricks on a skateboard. You never know that was a rail yard. Goshen's got a senior center in the middle of the yard. And then the trail picks up somewhere past that to take you out towards Middletown. So it's what happened. It's sad. Yeah. But, you know, All right, let me let me run through the rest of these, and we'll see if there's any open comments uh, at the end. So, Jeff, uh, I'm sorry if I get your name wrong. Youst notes that GP Tower in Goshen was identical to Maitland Tower uh, out on in Ohio on the Dayton branch. That's interesting. Uh, Gordon Davids uh, talking about spending money, and that the after World War II, the you spent a lot of money just to get it off the books. They would do things multiple times and just spend a lot of money. There was, I guess, at one point in time when they actually had money. Because uh, we were talking about how the GB Tower was uh, freshened up just before it was torn down. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, that, that set of uh, l &E Tower, uh, the speculation here is that the fifth might have been an ABBA set with an RS as one of the units mixed in. Uh, 709, LNE 709 had a unique paint scheme due to having been involved in a wreck. Right. right. Uh, LNE 706 got a paint scheme too. Like 706 got a cigar band too. 706 and 709 both got different schemes. LNE track was well maintained. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess I made this comment and then you started talking about the location so we can skip it. But um, uh, Jim, I guess curiosity, Conklin Lumber in Goshen shows mm -hmm. up in the, in the Shepherd track diagram book. Right. And I was just curious if you knew how, how long did that remain an active uh, rail? I think it stayed I think it stayed there almost to the end uh, because one of the things that got John Stellwagen to get all these shots, he was in the lumber business. And I think he worked at that yard. Okay. So uh, I think he retired from that yard, as a matter of fact. So um, it probably got right to the end because there's still cars that you see on the Montgomery branch in that area right up into the end and there's nothing above it so it has to be them the coal bunker is long gone right gordon notes that he high railed the montgomery branch in 1969 with the late john drake uh, he had not seen trains for quite some time at that point uh yeah, between, sounds about right between goshen and montgomery anyway did he go across uh, the diamond the di i think the diamond got taken out in a wreck in the late 60s though that's the thing I have some pictures of, I think it's uh, new GP35s or something by the tower. And they're dated, and I think, in the late 60s. And the diamond is gone. I, I know there was I, a wreck. Gordon, if I, you're I, still I, on. I think the diamond was still there in MQ when we crossed it, but not necessarily. Because with a high rail, we had lots, lots of flexibility to get off and set back on again. I can't remember the exact move we made at MQ, but we did go to Montgomery. Yeah. Okay, uh, getting through the last one here. Uh, Emil Willerko says, great presentation. Thank you. 
John Barth, last day of the LNE was October 31st, 61. Correct. Uh, Gordon notes that the Erie and LNE interchange in Goshen predates, of course, the building of the Graham line and things like that. Right. And it just didn't make any sense to not keep it there. You know, why add extra miles for both railroads halls by moving it up to Campbell Hall or somewhere like One that? One thing I, I forgot to mention that you just reminded me of is that in the early inception of the Walk Hill Valley and the Erie ran that for a while, the New York Central used to run to Goshen also in the early years. And so you actually had a three railroad town. And then eventually got cut back with, uh, you know, just the Montgomery. But they actually did run in the 1800s, maybe the early 1900s. I'm not sure when it ended. There's a new book coming out on the Walk Hill Valley that might be in. Um, that, that You know, that was a three railroad town one, but New York Central, l and &E, and the Erie. So, it's, you know, it's interesting that, it could, you know, what would have been like if it was still like that. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of compliments to you, Doug, because uh, it absolutely was a great show. Uh, someone offering uh, hopes that your dog is well. Well, Turned thank well. you. Uh, when was the last commuter train on the line? Hmm. Let's see. I think by 85, it's ripped out. So I'm going to say somewhere between 83 and 80, 80, 83, 84, something. I had the date. I think Steve Cohen's the guy who actually had the date in something. I seem to remember. Uh, and it might be in Marv's uh, his father's scrapbooks, which are here in my house that I didn't avail yeah. myself of. I, I, but it was I, right I, in that time period because when I came up in the area with, with my wife, uh, the tracks were already gone, and this is spring of 85. So yeah. I, it's in my be office, I have a timetable, the first timetable for the Grand Line service. And in order for them to do it, right, they had the stations put outside of town and everything to run it. Uh, all right. More thanks. Thanks. Great show. Uh, what did that last small tower, you sh oh, this is Bob, uh, Barr's question, the last small tower that you showed control? I think there's a pair, a, 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 a pair of crossovers out there when the main line was the main line. There was no Graham line. And it doesn't show up in the 1903 telegraph guide. So that picture has to be, I'm going to say, 1800s. And I think it came from, I think it came from Dennis Yakachek, and that was the rough vicinity of where that tower was. And Dennis would, <laughs> that was so cool. He 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 knows the telegraph call letters like we were learning the alphabet when we were kids on <laughs> here, and he's the one who came. Gave, I think gave me that, so I think it was right in that neck of the woods for that. Uh, th those might have been manual block stations before they yeah. put in automatic uh, signals and just block station, not even uh, control interlocking. Right. Uh, let's see, almost to the end here. Uh, Logan Geigner, I turned off my cell phone. This demands 100% attention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bob, bars, all the crossing signals around Goshen appeared to be painted white. I guess the signal masks um, was that common eerie practice. I, I, I can't, I don't know. I don't know. I believe, I believe it was practice to paint them white until I started painting them silver. And I think silver came along with Erie Lackawanna. I'm not sure, I don't remember the time, but there was a time when Erie painted them white. And all of a sudden, and all of, also putting black and white checkerboards on their low clearance highway bridges, bridges over highways too. It's funny, I never noticed that. The one thing I did notice in how many of the cross bucks would have the striping on it and they'd write the Erie on it. I think the Susquehanna had something like that, too. Those I always picked up on. Those were always yeah. cool to say. Uh, last one, Dave Mac McKay. Thank you, Doug. Rode this line. It was nice to see it again. So those were the last questions in the chat. Uh, I'll open it up now. If anybody has any other questions that have come to mind uh, since we've been talking, uh, it is... 10.06, so we don't want to keep everybody up all night. We but, didn't do too bad time-wise, though. Right? That's but, pretty good. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to ask them now. Yeah, so this is Steve Cohen, Marv's son. Hey, Steve. Hello. So I'll tell you why Dad was in was in Goshen um, regularly. So the New York Daily News, which, of course, had Dick Tracy on the cover on Sundays, only was delivered as far as Goshen. So if you wanted to buy the New York Daily News in Middletown, you had to drive to Goshen. So every Sunday morning, he, he and a lot of times with me, drove to Goshen to pick up the newspaper at, 
you'd call it today a convenience store, but it was more of a corner store back then. And then, of course, go to the railroad station. And so I'll bet a lot of those slides, you know, pictures from the 50s through the 70s, you know, were taken. Of course, he was going to go down there for that. So the Daily News is now, you know, comes daily to Middletown along with the Post and the Times and everything else. But back then, it that was as far that the drivers would go in Goshen. That's interesting. Yep. So um, one, uh, while we were looking here, I, I went to the, the absolute always correct source for information, uh, a.k.a. Wikipedia. <laughs> 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 so take it for, with a grain of salt, but it was saying that the first day of service for passengers on the Graham line was April 18th, 1983. 83. Yeah. Wow. I have pictures that a gentleman gave me of them scrapping the last track from Middletown towards Goshen with a couple of Conrail units. I don't know if there's a date on it. And what he did, he started walking from Goshen along the last track, not knowing that as he got close to the Middletown, he was going to run into the scrap train. But I don't know if he's got a date on when actually they were ripping that out. I, I remember 1969, uh, I took Sperry Car 140 through Goshen, uh, testing both tracks on the Erie Lackawanna, of course. And the uh, Sperry Cars did strange things to the current in the track. And the crossing gates were going up and down all the way through Middletown for about an hour and a half. I think they still have a price on my head for that. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing it was then than today, because people have so little patience today. It's incredible. I think they, part of that is the cell phone mentality. Patience. They had no patience then either, believe me. <laughs> but compared to today, they had patience. I mean, they got used to stopping for a train. Today, we have too many people decide to drive around a crossing gate. And that, we have that, problems. That's, that's one reason they're running on the Graham line now instead of the main line. Yeah, yeah. Okay, any other questions? All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for participating yeah. and for your questions. Doug? Steve, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Doug, for uh, all the hard work you put in here and uh, sharing. And uh, I, you and I need to get together because I have a, a, a disc for you with, with drawings. Oh, I greatly appreciate that. And thanks for all your guys' comments. And again, thanks for the privilege of being able to share this because... Um, it's it's great to have people who, who have all the knowledge you guys have. And I think I'd sometimes, both of these programs, I think I learned about as much from the audience as I did in doing my own research, which is why it's so much fun to do a program, you know. And it, it it's, you know, I wish they paid me for this instead of teaching calculus. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Doug. It's a very, infor very informative program. I greatly appreciate it. Makes my day. And, you know, hopefully down the road, we'll do some of the branches and the Middletown programs for you because they're all they're all here and I just need to have the time to, to do it down the road. We'll do it. Super. All right. Well, I'm going to say good night. Good night, Rich. Thanks for uh, everything. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Have a good night. Good night. Stay safe and stay well. All. Take care. Good night. Bye bye.